Good morning to most, good afternoon to others, and good evening to viewing audiences across the pond. I am Jason Miles, your host for another episode of This is Revolution Pod, a podcast. If you're new to the channel, please like and subscribe. If you're enjoying what you see, make sure you hit that notification bell as we're constantly adding new shows, doing cross streams with other channels. Before I bring in the gang, I first off want to thank all the subscribers on platforms like YouTube and Twitch, and of course, Apple, all the other audio only formats, and of course, all the patrons. Without you, we couldn't do this. If you'd like to have access to the champagne room, past and present. If you'd like to be there, be part of the live virtual audience for the Pascal Robert hosted Mau Mau Hour. And if you want to join us for movie night, as we had a movie night last night, we watched film They Live. John Carpenter classic, which I did enjoy. It's a little dated in some parts, but uh, it's a fun film. There's only one way to have access to all this exciting stuff, all these extras that we provide here, and that's become a patron for as little as $2 a month for $30 for the year. It can all be yours. Now with that out of the way, let's bring in our Condre characters. He's coming from Miami, Florida, by way of New York City. He is the man of the Mau Mau Hour. He is the Pascal Robert. Peace and greetings to the audience. Peace and greetings to the chat. Peace and greetings, Jason Miles. You excited for the show today? I'm looking forward. I like the subject matter. I'm looking forward to this to the show. In reading Tammy's book, I was just like, this is just even outside of the TIR uh, reference, it was like, this is just in Pascal's wheelhouse. I pictured you reading it and like just heard, you make me feel like, <laughs> like that's all you heard as you were reading it. <laughs> Sylvester's playing in the background. It was great. Speaking of one of the biggest Sylvester fans I know, also from New York City, M. Tucson. Hello, hello, everyone. Hello, Pascal. Plaid shirt Pascal today. Thank you for noticing. Hello, birthday Barbie. <gasps> ah! Birthday Barbie. Gotta love it. Our very own Funshine Barbie is having his birthday. You're very today. lucky I wore a shirt today because I was really prepared. Oh my God. So, not was, ready for the taco meat, bro. I was prepared to go shirtless with just the denim vest and the kerchief because it's that denim season. Denim vest. Good grief. <laughs> the man, the man titties and the taco meat would have been too much, dude. <laughs> oh man. I would have, I would, the vest would have covered the nips. Hopefully. <laughs> Our poor guest, <laughs> our poor guest had no idea what she was getting into. When she come on this show. She's like, you know, we're getting, as the show is getting bigger, we're starting to get hit up by more and more um, publicists. And I always want to respond when they hit us up for requests. Like, have you, have you seen the show before? Are you sure you want to bring this person on for that? So there's a there's a few I'm gonna um, throw your guys' way to, to take a look at some some show requests that we've been getting, very interesting, to say the least. But I think our topic today is very interesting, and it it fits so well for Saturday's show. And I actually booked this to happen on my birthday. I need to make sure of that is electronic dance music a genre that is utopian. This is a place where gender, race, and class all collide harmoniously on dance floors worldwide. Can the dance floor serve as an incubator for resistance? Dance music is also a genre that has been broadly defined by its use of non-traditional instruments. So how does the emergence of AI affect it? From her upcoming book, Dance Music, A Feminist Account of Ordinary Culture, 
Outside my own initial experience and beyond, what I had read in dance music scholarship and journalism, I did not know many people who spoke about euphoria and progress on the dance floor. The people I knew were more likely to be uneasy about going to club nights, festivals, and free parties. The social dynamics deterred them. Most reservations were expressed by women. The unease of these women was put into sharp relief when I started working as a DJ and conducting field work. Venue staff repeatedly assumed I was someone's girlfriend. You see that a lot in the rock world too. Rather than a peer of the other DJs with whom I shared a club residency, clubbers, always men, would regard my technique and tell me I was pretty good for a girl. Sometimes I went to nightclubs alone to conduct field work. Hold on one second, sorry about that. Um, once on the way to a small venue in Berlin, I was attacked, restrained, assaulted, and robbed by two strangers. Disbelieving locals told me nothing like this ever happened there, that I was just unlucky. Others told me it must have been because I looked like a tourist. You mustn't look like a tourist. As my research developed, men continued to harass me in venues, on dance floors, and on my way home from clubs, regardless of where I was in the world. But something else happened too. As a clubber, DJ, and occasional event organizer who did everything from booking and promotion to taking cash and stamping wrists, I absorbed the regularities of distinction that defined this and many other musical worlds. I developed prejudices about how people dressed, talked, and behaved. I could tell immediately which people would ruin the vibe and who would cause trouble. How a gathering of women for a bachelor party or hand night would Miss the point. In short, I was part of the problem that I was learning to identify. I inhabited the fundamental tension at the heart of dance music culture and at the core of this book. That, again, is an excerpt from Dance Music, a feminist account of ordinary culture. Please welcome Tammy Gadir. Tammy is a lecturer in music in the, in the music industry at RMIT University in Melbourne, Australia. Gadir's research addresses the social and political mechanisms of musical life, specializing on the cultures, sounds, and technologies of electronic dance music. Please welcome Tammy Gadir. And also, Tammy is coming live from Michael Jackson's Rock With You video. Uh, she had a flex capacitor out there in Australia. So yep. everything don't so if a dancing Michael Jackson, you know, is behind her, don't be alarmed, folks. It's just it what happens. It's what happens. That's right. Thanks so much for having me. Well, Tammy, thank you for doing this because originally when we talked, we talked about doing a pre-record because you live in the worst place ever for people like me to do a show. <laughs> As I live on the Pacific time zone and you are in Australia, I don't even know what the time zone is over there. It doesn't matter. Don't even say it. <laughs> so <laughs> the only other time uh, we've done these shows is generally, super, for me, super early in the morning when we had Robert Miles on. I think it was like 3 or 4 a.m., right, Tucson? Was it 4 a.m. for me? Oh, sorry. I muted. Was it 4 a.m. we did that show, Tucson? I believe so. Well, for me, it's definitely later for you. <laughs> yeah. Dirty, dirty bastard. Tammy. Yes. Um, you quoted TIR in the first chapter of your book. How did I that sure quote did. come about? Uh, well, I was struck during your interview with Jeremiah McAllister uh, about there were things that he talked about that were not in any of the official accounts that I had read. Um, and I was particularly struck by the way that he talked about uh, the, the, he sort of broke the mythologies of mm, easy access technologies and cheap technologies as a way of making music. Um, and as a reason why people were making dance music from a particular period or making music with electronic instruments. Um, and I, I just really, really remember that quote where he said he remembered uh, that he got an 808, um, mm -hmm. which he shared with his brother for $800. And he specifically remembered the $800 because of the 808. Uh, and $800 would not have been cheap 
at this time. You would have had to save for that, right? Mm -hmm. So, yeah, and and I just really appreciated um, the perspective of someone who's been, you know, part of the production world for so many well decades now at this point. Yeah. Um, yeah. Shout out to Jeremiah McAllister as well. Shout out, indeed. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's a he's a big time player in the game. And for those that haven't watched those shows, I mean, sadly, the first show was pulled down for three months, but it's back up. But those histories on uh, on dance music, on house music are some of my favorite shows, favorite conversations. Pascal, I know you have questions since. Absolutely. You make me feel. <laughs> One of the things I appreciated about your background, Tammy, is that you're an actual DJ, which, you know, in and of itself made me just develop all kinds of questions like you know what is your favorite genre of house disco do you do, do you i mean like what i so we could go there for hours <laughs> in and of itself. but pertinent to the nature of our show in terms of political economy and dialectical materialism very early on in your book i believe it's in the introduction you very clearly state that these genres uh, electronic dance music, and you clearly define that dance music isn't just any music you dance to, because people have been dancing since, you know, probably the 19th century. But you particularly note that this is a particular a genre of music that comes about in the 70s, after the period of the 60s, in what we call here the 50-year counter-revolution, and you talk about the groups of people who are the progenitors or who are pushing the music forward. You talk about, you know, the LGBTQ community, the black community and the Latino community as the or original uh, kind of nucleus of this music. I didn't realize till after our show that within the world of uh, electronic music, there's still tension to admit that in some circles. Can you elaborate on why some people have a problem acknowledging that there are these kind of different communities that originated this music and are, so, I mean, let's be honest, kind of seem to be trying to gentrify it, if you will? Mm. Um, well, I would say that most people who I talk to about dance music when I talk about dance music definitely know um, they're, they're not the people who don't know that, you know, the music originated from, um, you know, particularly uh, gay black communities in New York, for example. Um, it's, I'm going to say it's pretty common knowledge in the sort of dance music fan circles now. Um, I wouldn't say it's necessarily a point of tension or, um, you know, like a, a problem, but I think a lot of people don't realise or a lot of people in, you know, Australia or Europe don't necessarily realise that those are the origins because dance music now in those places is, um, I'm going to say, a mostly white scene um, and it's pretty mainstream as well. So you wouldn't necessarily see any signs of those origins uh, if you hadn't read a story or been told by somebody else um, or watched, you know, some kind of popular culture representation of it. So I think it's more that more that the, the, the visible signs of it are not necessarily there, more than that there's actually tensions about those origin stories at this point. Interesting. Did you want to add something to you, Sam? I did. Um, I thought that the fact that we were quoted in the book makes me think that you prefer oral histories to what is declared in books already. Where does this preference come from? And can you tell us a bit about it? Yeah, so I I did a lot of interviewing. I mean, I'm you know, I, I did a, a doctorate in a sort of tradition that is, um, you know, can be traced back to the Chicago School of Sociology, if you want, you know, uh, I mean, broadly. And that's well, a very, yeah. <laughs> right. <laughs> I, I, I knew I was high risk in saying that here. <laughs> um, you know, and, you're going to get my attention with saying that one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, I suppose all I mean by that, and, and I mean it in the broadest sense possible, you know, uh, doing ethnographic work, interviewing people, being in a field, um, talking to people, uh, you know, um, observing 
um, being on the inside but also on the outside while you're researching something. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I felt like I learned a lot from from just being around and and being around both as a DJ um, and also on dance floors, you know, from both sides, if you like. Um, and in terms of talking to people, yeah, I, I learn a lot about something from speaking to people who aren't in my own head because, you know, when I started out researching, um, I had a lot of assumptions based on, you mm. know, I was a music nerd, so I thought everybody was experiencing this in the kind of way that I was and was as obsessed with sound as I was. And really there were a whole lot of other things that people cared about that weren't just, you know, the specifics of sound. So um, I just learned a lot from actually hearing other people's perspectives. And I think that's a really useful way to learn about a living social environment, not just rely on my own um, very limited or narrow perspective. Can I ask a personal question, if you don't mind? Sure. How does Where did you first get exposed to uh, electronic music, house music, disco, club? Um, did you say where or, or when? Where or when? Where, or, where, where, and, where and when? Um, actually, I liked it as a as a young teen. Uh, I think I first really got exposed to it from commercial mm -hmm. radio stations doing like Saturday night remixes of well known pop hits. Mm -hmm. Or now, Tammy, of, where, um, where are you from? Because you went to school all over the place and you traveled all over the place. So, are you from Australia? I'm from Sydney. Okay. Yeah. So I, I left Sydney to do postgraduate research in um, Europe. But up until that point, I was I was in Sydney. So I spent my whole youth there. Um, and, and you yeah. come from the classical piano world. Yeah, I was a classical music nerd big time. Yeah. So how does one go? Because when you're a classical, depending on how deep you go into it, you know, um, I did music for years with a, quote, classical piano nerd. Um, uh, I was I was pretty serious about it. I went to a like a high school that was kind of a conservatorium, but for for high school students. Um, and I, you know, I I don't think I consciously thought I want to be a concert pianist. But you don't really go to a conservatorium for any other reason that you, you know you want your training for like the elite levels of performance. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but you know, I had a very useful. Uh, uh, reckoning when I was there that I, as soon as I got to an environment where everybody was in the was there for the same reason and had the same goals, uh, I quickly realised that I was average <laughs> compared with all of these great, you know. <laughs> um, and that was really useful because um, then I was able to decide, well, for university, I'm not going to keep pursuing the idea that I might be, you know, the one out of however many people who want to be a concert pianist. I'm going to go do other things um, as well. So I didn't just do a music degree. I did a music and arts double degree, which meant I was able to do things like sociology and, and other, um, you know, learn things beyond just the practice of music, which was very useful for me. So what, what catches the ear of a piano music nerd that's going to get you away from all the Baroque stuff you have to know and, uh, you know, get into something that's antithetical to everything you're doing? I suppose that's part of the reason that I love dance music, that it was completely, um, I mean, I suppose structurally there were things that you could say I liked patterns, you know, and both both kinds of music are, have kind of patterns that you can follow and, and structure. Um, but beyond that, I just really loved electronic sound because it was like being out of space compared with, you know, listening to acoustic and orchestral instruments and um I just really loved, like it. I, it just made me want to dance. You know, it was as simple as that, really. <laughs> so uh, I was just attracted to it, um, to how it sounded. So I know you're a lot younger. So do you come to the dance music world um, at a time where there's computerized turntables, or are you still part of the generation that has to actually buy records, learn how to put records together for mixing? How does your DJ experience start? Because there, there really is a, a very big difference <laughs> between those two worlds. Yeah, in terms of performance uh, practice, mm -hmm. definitely, yes. Uh, well, uh, I well, I was going clubbing first for a while before I actually learned how to DJ. And I that was what drew me to 
the idea that, you know, I, I listened to other DJs play mm. and I, as a classical musician, I had a kind of arrogance. I was like, oh, well, I could definitely do that. I could probably do that better than them, you know. Um, so I, I decided that I would have a go at it. And I, I learned with this guy who was a hip hop DJ who taught me on vinyl first. Um, so in, I learned in Australia. On, yeah. Interesting. Impressive. You learned how to DJ on vinyl. Yes, I learned how to DJ on vinyl, but because I knew I was moving countries pretty soon, I didn't. I didn't stick with it as because I knew I wouldn't be able to haul collections of records with me around. So um, I I moved to CDs for a while. And I have, mind you, you know, CDs accumulate too. Um, I have a lot of CDs and it becomes quite heavy, but of course, eventually it became USB sticks. So, <laughs> so, so you were, you, were you like most young, uh, young kids are learning how to DJ and you were just fucking up your parents' records or, you, yeah, <laughs> you know, records, fuck no, they had records, but they weren't DJ appropriate. Um, my, my parents were also classical music nerds. So, no, oh, wow. <laughs> your house sounds boring as shit, Tammy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, no, they, they liked other music as well. But no, the records that we had at home were, were mostly, um, I don't know about mostly classical, but like classical and old, not, not you don't want to put like, them on Technics turntables. You didn't want to <laughs> throw the Lawrence Welk on and like mix it with Porgy and Bess. You weren't trying to do that. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> that wasn't the, no? No. Nah. Okay, but you did learn on turntables first, which is interesting. Yeah. Uh, did you have Geminis or Techniques? Techniques. Look at you. Wow! Look at you! Don't, don't Look at you! To be clear, to be clear, I didn't have them. I I went to a studio. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. No, no, I didn't own them. They were like impossible to get at the time. You would have. I would to say them. you'd have yeah. to import them, and I'm assuming that everything like that costs an arm and a leg. Uh, yeah, they're extremely expensive because everybody wants them. Pascal, do you want to add something to the I'm, I'm, uh, I'm, uh, I'm mildly impressed to learn that you started DJing on vinyl with techniques, which if I'm not mistaken, you can't even get anymore. I think they discontinued, and didn't they discontinue manufacturing them? Pretty sure, yeah, yeah. Wow. I'm sure I'm sure there's a hipster somewhere with, uh, <laughs> that, that definitely has got an in. Some techniques fell off of a, <laughs> a truck. Right. Well, what I wanted to ask you, Tammy, is getting to the political economy, mm -hmm. the historical development of electronic music. I mean, we talked about this with uh, Jeremiah, but can you frame your narrative on the the role of political economy in the development of how electronic music comes about in the early 70s, late 60s, after this kind of shift, global shift, you know, you have the Nixon shock, you have the way in which capitalism is transitioning into neoliberalism, and how exactly do those factors play a role in the development of this music, particularly in New York, which is going through an economic crisis right at this time, and cities that have been dealing with urban rebellions from 61, from 67 to 71. How does this all fit together? I'd like to hear your thoughts. Well, I should say that, you know, the the histories that I took down were, in a sense, a compilation of other people's histories, right? Because I was I wasn't there, um, and you know I I didn't I didn't use primary sources. I used I used the writing of other dance music scholars who have done that work and interviewed people who were there, or indeed who were there themselves. Um, so it was more like a historiographic um, uh, analysis of all of these histories that kind of coalesce around New York, Detroit, Chicago, um, later Berlin, other places, the UK, Ibiza, et cetera. Um, in terms of how all of those factors that you mentioned contribute to the scene, uh, I would say that the fact that people were for a while able to go to these underground unlicensed venues and put on parties relatively undisturbed or, um, you know, uh, police left them alone, right? Like you were able to run these events and people in the cities knew about them. Like people in New York knew about the underground clubs in New York 
um, if they were in that in that world, they knew about them and you could go and it was a safe place to go. Um, but at a certain point uh, when, you know, the property prices went up and when residents started to try to drive out those kinds of events and venues, um, you know, that stuff just started to shut down because it became a kind of... Uh, it just it just became impossible you know you couldn't you couldn't do it it was too too repressed too suppressed so in a sense the the scene was uh was kind of oppressed and repressed by uh the effects of neoliberalism but i think as you also suggest neoliberalism is one of the things that was happening at the time that um that disco grew out of new york and uh i think you know, there's something to be said for the reduction in the number of people that you need in a band to be able to play dance music. So we're talking about um, things becoming more affordable uh, or perhaps that, you know, venues or promoters can profit more. Um, you're talking about uh, an environment where uh, people are looking for, you know, entertainment um, that, you uh, allows them to completely escape um, the nightmares of their working lives and their non-working lives. And, you know, in, in many respects, the the environment of the all-night dance floor is a sort of like a perfect place to escape from all of that, but it's also kind of a place where all of that coalesces at the same time. Tucson, did you want to add something to that? Not at the moment. <laughs> <laughs> you 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 always have to add something whenever I ask you. For I know, but like sometimes I can't. I was very interested in Pascal's line of questioning. Counselor, would you care to continue? Yeah, that's yeah. No. There you go. Look at him. He got no, no problem. <laughs> I listen. I it's not it's not often that we have someone who's an actual scholar of. Right. A uh, popular music genre that not only influenced not only everyone on the show, but is so particularly crucial to uh, the history of this of this fifty year period. I mean, dance music is a big deal. And one of the things I want to ask you now, I saw in your footnote where you quote our show, you you actually quoted me in my position about how popular culture in the wake of the Kerner Commission report in the post-civil rights era in the face of the urban rebellions was used as a demobilizing technique to pacify radicalism in black urban spaces. And this is transparent by what is written in the, in, in the Kerner Commission uh, report. Uh, how do you, do you would you say that that is a possible analysis of the way in which the promotion, particularly starting with disco, how it floats from this urban reality and the hyper production of these forms of music exists so fast? You're seeing disco on on television, set uh, uh, soul soul train, and it happens so quickly. Do you see this as part? of the uh, arsenal of tools of demobilization. In other words, instead of getting them to read Fanon, let's make them dance 24 hours a day. <laughs> um, I didn't see it necessarily as kind of a, mm, a nefarious tool of demobilization as such, uh, but I definitely take your point, and there's a broad sense in which I agree with you that um, that these environments which on the one hand have been safe havens for marginalized people um and you know are kind of meant to be off grid and uh they're about resistance and they're about you know not being in the mainstream you know it doesn't take long at all before they're totally in the mainstream um and this is even way pre-saturday night fever of course, people always talk about Saturday Night Fever as being a kind of moment where, you know, disco sort of exploded into the 
you know, globalized consciousness. Um, that was late in the game. That was late in the game. Yeah, late seventies. Yeah, um, and you know, of course, it probably had some kind of effect like that. But before that, disco was, as you said, like already like a very mediatized um, genre, and people knew it was happening. And I do, yeah, dancing all night long as a means of expressing political resistance or, or doing politics, I think, has been, you know, some of the um, the arguments that are made uh, in scholarly work on dance music that, you know, part of the motivation for writing my book was to um, to disagree with that, you know, that, that you can make those arguments that people are, um, you know, dancing because they object to whatever's going on in the world around them, but to say that to, to put any kind of weight or significance politically on the dance floor or the happenings around the dance floor beyond we're out here to, you know, lose ourselves and, and maybe maybe there's a kind of collective coming together, which, you know, fine, that's, that's really nice and that's a good thing. I don't want to trivialise that. But, yeah, to say that that could replace some kind of, like, organised political work I think um, is a problem, and that is those are the claims that this book was writing against. That that's what I was reading in the lead up to writing this book, and that's what kind of shocked me that people were claiming that actually. Well, Jason and I and Toussaint have talked about the the uh, theory that many of our generation, generation X, generation X, posited that hip hop was the revolution. It was our was our generation's contribution to the Black liberation struggle was, <laughs> and um, I, which I've always thought was ridiculous. Jason might, might want to chime in on. Would you, would you would you then say? I mean, it's interesting you bring that up, Pascal. And I'd love to get you guys' opinion on this. Um, so for Tammy to say like it's kind of I don't want to say silly. I don't want to put words in your mouth, but there is something as someone that has worked at massive dance festivals. I don't know if you can see it. My EDC badges. Mm. Wow. Um, the biggest ones in North America. There is yeah. nothing political uh, about those festivals. I've worked at all the major ones. Um, I mean, I, I feel like you can say the same thing about hip hop, right? Because what really is the political action you get from hip hop? Is it is it just that there's words that sound like politics or people that might listen to the music get into politics like well i mean i think i what people would say um you know about the festivals that you worked at like edc electric daisy carnival for carnival for those who um aren't in the know um you know that they they would say well those aren't the right festivals you need to go to the right festivals you know you need to go to the ones that are um oh the hippie that, ones where everybody's wearing hemp <laughs> either of those where no one has no one's vaccinating their kids for like polio right oh, man. <laughs> wow cool just scene. a bunch of white people with dreadlocks like that's a better one well okay. there there are those or there are you know um the ones that that invite djs that have you know cultural capital or subcultural capital and credibility within um within dance music circles and and um, yeah, there will there'll be, or there'll be people who say, well, festivals are not, not the right place to go. You have to go to, you know, um, free parties or you need to go to, you know, specific types of clubs and that play specific types of music. So they will always say it's not because of the scene as a whole. They'll say it's because you're not, you, you're, there's this alternative versus mainstream kind of um, argument, you know. But, and, but I, even if I, like, like, let's just say, let's just say. I go to a free party. It's like, what am I going to see there? Is it going to be like a Black Panther meeting in 1965? Or is <laughs> no. it going to be, again, the same thing I saw at EDC, but this time with white people with dreadlocks, <laughs> probably all vegan, and no one's vaccinated against <laughs> anything. I'm not talking about COVID. I'm talking about like anything. No, no, anything. I get you. Um, Everything's uncircumcised. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like an interesting thing. Um, no, I mean, I suppose, uh, 
so the the I'm going to go again on on the kind of the narratives that I was writing against. So the <laughs> the, the authors, um, the authors. I'm, I'm assuming something in the chat is uh, mm -hmm. going off here. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> don't read that. Don't read that. <laughs> um, the uh, the people would say that you know their their special experiences or their sort of transcendental experiences came came at places where. Um, you know, the music and the drugs and the 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 vibe and the people were kind of um, unified and, um, you know, everybody has changed their lifestyle as a result of going to these events together and, you know, this sort of transformative narrative, which is obviously really rooted in the, um, you know, the 1960s counterculture, which I also talk about in the book. Um, so that's what they would say. But I don't, um, I don't really buy that. I mean, I don't think that just because, you know, a uh, scene is um, aesthetically subversive, that that mm, gives it political significance automatically, right? Which, but well, they said the same thing about, about rave culture. I mean, the way we talk about disco right now, I don't know if anybody wants to go in their way back machine to like the late 90s. That was the same way we viewed rave culture. Um, I don't yeah. know if it caught on the same way that we look at disco. Uh, and I don't know why, maybe because it wasn't as flamboyant, maybe because there were no personalities in the forefront like disco has, because there still were people singing. Um, mm. Is disco the first time that the DJ, to some effect, becomes a massive power player? I mean, I'm mean, not talking about just rock radio. I mean, like on the dance floor, the DJ is a is a is a big time influence on the music. Yeah. Um, is this the first time that happens? Um. In, in that particular way, yes, but we're talking about like the, you know, the thing that makes disco the sort of uh, the, the, the starting point in a way is that it's the first time you have, um, you know, song selectors, DJs doing, doing it as continuous all night, no breaks. Mm -hmm. um, it's all about keeping people on the dance floor as the primary goal. Um, and and these kinds of new techniques of mixing that allow the music to continue without breaks is um, is started around then and well, never stopped about, since. Thinking about DJs, I've been thinking about radio DJs in the payola era. Yeah, that's why I did. That's a whole different concept, right? Yeah, I mean, that's a different kind of DJ. But I mean, to answer the question, I think that there is a time when DJs have influence over the development of music in the 50s oh yeah the early payola eras but it's not the same type of dj it's not like no uh, no yeah 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 so i didn't want i didn't want to bring that that's a whole different world and that's a different that's a whole different conversation if you want to talk about payola and music because it still exists to this day it just looks different it's playlist placement instead of instead of radio but um yeah, yeah the, it's the never Mm. But the DJs on the radio are still, you know, they're also taste makers in in a similar way. So and they and they they have a kind of curating role in very much a similar way that dance floor DJs do. I suppose, yeah, the difference is that um, you know a dance floor DJ is a physical presence in a room as well, and that's a really important aspect, um, especially as you go on, uh, you know, further on into toward the present, like the DJ, you know, becomes a kind of rock star in, in, in and of themselves. Um, and, you know, people who were at the early days, you know, house scenes in <clears throat> places like New York, you know, would complain that that the DJ used to be, I, I don't know if it was actually specifically New York, but you hear people say how the, the DJ booth used to just be on the same level as the dance floor. And it didn't matter actually where the DJ was placed. People knew that they were there and they were there dancing and the dancing was the main focus of the event. Um, and, and you know, people would interact with the DJ as if they were kind of one of them. Um, whereas, you know, later on it was elevated or on a platform or on a stage and then, you know, at the front or if in the case of the giant stadium gigs with, you know, DJs like Tiesto in the middle of these huge, like, circular Massive. kinds of spaces. Yeah. So, so many explosions. Yeah, lots of explosions. That's right. Fireworks, explosions, all of that. Yeah. So, um, yeah, so the DJ becomes their own kind of superstar. But that that 
in in that kind of way that doesn't really happen until the 90s the 90s is sort of the beginnings of um like the poster the poster person or poster boy dj you know um kind of in a comparable way to the rock star and then in the 2000s and sort of 2010s is when you start to have djs that all of a sudden they they have to kind of look the part as well they look like celebrities all of a sudden before they kind of it didn't matter if they looked shabby that was sort of part of the aesthetic <laughs> um and then yeah and then you had like the avicis and the kind of yeah the, these sorts of djs who um mostly in europe who who uh you know looked like they worked out and and kept themselves nice and clean and so forth that was a really different different kind of vibe not not kind of dirty raving <laughs> or anything like that i'd actually like to ask you this very specific question about djing is that um why is the art form or profession, if you will, why is it so gendered? Skewed mm. male. Probably lots of reasons. Uh, I, I mean, one of them is that uh, there are long historical associations with machine and electronic technologies being masculine domains, um, especially those that are to do with like. DIY tinkering and things to do with, um, you know, well, technic technical sound related music technologies um, were marketed as uh, marketed directly to men uh, after World War Two. It was like a way of showing how masculine you were, you know, sh like show your new fancy hi fi sound system. Um, Good answer. <laughs> um and that that's um that uh, uh, another scholar wrote wrote a really helpful article about that back in the 90s to, you know talked about the you know looked at the 1950s um magazines uh like industry magazines where they were selling all of these home home hi-fis and the marketing was absolutely speaking to this kind of formation of the po like uh, yeah remasculinizing the returned servicemen you know um in the middle class household um and giving them this kind of uh holy space where they could play with their their gear <laughs> um and and kind of have um you know what we now know as a man cave um for audio so there's there's those aspects um and then it's this sort of self-fulfilling you know self-perpetuating thing i suppose you know the djs are in the same way as like an orchestral conductor is sort of a central um, directing or managing, they're, they're in a managing role, <laughs> right? They're sort of, um, they, they, uh, they're in charge of, of what's going on on some level. Project and manager of entertainment. <laughs> project manager of entertainment. And there's something about those roles that, you know, has tended historically to fall to, um, to men, um, figures of authority, you know, um, so there's, there's, there's the social aspects as well, but there's lots of, uh, you know, research that talks about how, when, you know, young children are socialized by their parents with, with play that little boys are always encouraged to tinker with, with, um, random stuff and make mistakes and make things themselves and break things and, uh, and, and experiment and improvise and little girls are directed toward low risk kind of structured rules based activities that they don't, can don't follow hurt yourself, sweetheart don't you hurt it, yeah. exactly and not just don't hurt yourself but also like you don't want to be seen to make a mistake so you know mm -hmm. better better that you just follow these rules and and of course it's not just parents like it's picked up in school environments and everything um so the, the the boys and their toys thing is a really big obstacle to or has been it's it's less less of a problem now although no, it's I, still a problem but yeah. i do want to kind of ask you about that because you know we when we met you were interviewing me and of course i didn't get a chance to ask you about your your time in music too much um i don't even know if you mentioned to me that you were a dj that's that's effed up to <laughs> sorry as, and as someone that played for years with a with a woman, I was dating her at the time, but still, uh, it was interesting to see certain comments, you know, also racial comment, more racial comments than the female comments actually that I saw. Mm. Uh, way more racial comments. Uh, Jesus fucking crazy. Um, 
as a woman in DJing, I never really, because again, I haven't had a gen yet. Um, I've never experienced, I never even would think that someone would question if you knew what you were doing, because I've, I've seen so many, and maybe it's just living in the Bay Area, women sound people, women musicians, definitely tons of female DJs. For sure. Um, I, again, I, I don't know if it was different where you were coming up and, and maybe the, the women that I'm around, maybe their experience is also different. We're not having a long conversation about, Hey, did anyone ever tell you that you shouldn't do this? Cause you're parts. Mm. Um, it was interesting to me to read that. Can you tell us a little bit about, as you said, a DJ took you aside and wanted to show you how to do it on vinyl. Was this a, was this a male or a female? Oh, I sought him out because I knew that he could okay. could show me. Yeah. So in this instance, so when I wanted to learn, it was me approaching somebody. To and ask and to were learn. they were they willing to teach you right away, or was it like I don't teach ladies and they needed the b boy thing? Oh no no he it, it was his profession to teach DJing. <laughs> so, so, he, so they didn't care which. You were. No no not at all not okay. at all yeah. But outside of that relationship, which seems somewhat transactional. Yes. Um when you go into the club world, now you know what you're doing. Or even in that relationship, did they kind of do it in a mildly belittling manner or where there's always very serious? Um, oh, it varied. It really varied. Uh, I was around people who, you know, um, didn't pay attention to whether I was, you know, man, woman or otherwise. Mm -hmm. And I was around people who immediately foregrounded it and made it a thing, you know, and I, I wouldn't have thought to make it a thing until they made it a thing, you know. Gotcha. Um, but is it yeah. like an apprentice, apprenticey, or a, apprentice uh, master kind of relationship where it's like, I'm, I, I, my tattoos are all done by a woman who learned under a real rough man, and he was that way with men, like he was with women. It was just rough. Oh right. Learning um, in that environment. Is it a similar thing that it's just rough in that environment? No, it was more that you 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 tended to get ignored. Actually, or you, if you weren't being told that you couldn't do it, or you weren't being belittled, you were ignored. So um, you know, you'd have like groups of male DJs doing gear talk together before a gig, and somehow you wouldn't be in that conversation, or you know, you you wouldn't be invited into that into participate in that conversation. Um, and, you know, they were all quite happy to, um, just to talk. It, there's a kind of culture of nerd talk. Um, mm -hmm. and they were computer people as well. You know, they learned, they also could DJ using software, which I couldn't, I learned just with the, you know, the turntables and the mixer. And then I transferred that to CDJs and a mixer, and then I transferred that to still CDJs and a mixer, but with the <laughs> USB as my as my you know media source. Um, I don't I don't DJ using Tractor or Ableton, so um, um, because I came into it as a you know a person, I, I saw it as a sort of instrument because I was a piano player. Yeah. Um, so people who came in with computer nerd knowledge uh, just came in from a different angle than me, mm -hmm. uh, and I just didn't really you know, I didn't really speak their language and I, sometimes I tried, but I sort of, you know, at the same time, I, I couldn't, I couldn't participate in the same way, <laughs> in the same way. I was not, I didn't care about the gear actually. For me, DJing is a means to an end. I want to make people dance. <laughs> no, um, I get it. I get yeah. it. I'm in a band with people. One guitar player hates talking about gear. So after a show, he will literally walk away from someone that has, wants to have like, what pedals? Are they? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Like but it's interesting to see people in the chat talking about how someone in particular pointed out that that post-war women were the ones messing around with computers like culturally mm -hmm. and and it was true yeah. both and it was also known to be true um and um uh, and they're right and that that you know women in electronic music have have been very present in culture for, for yeah a very long time and you have Delia Derbyshire with the BBC Radiophonic Workshop um, you know, the, the Doctor Who theme. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. And you have, uh, um, you know, Wendy Carlos, as somebody said as well, um, switched on Bach and, and so on. And, um, yeah, like it, it, it's true that women have been messing around with electronic music outside the dance music world, more in the kind of experimental 
world for for a long time um and yet you know when you read some of the like you know some of the dj histories that were written in the late 90s or early 2000s there's like 400 pages and then you know one sentence mentioning some women in the history and like 400 pages from the first radio dj to you know the present and in that time they didn't think to mention all the women who were part of the culture and that's you know that's just how the, the histories were written um but that didn't mean that those women weren't there and that there's been corrections to that in fact i think that very book that i'm referring to has had its most recent edition has a section that's been updated with like the women in the scene um from the early days to the present um but yeah it's still the case that the sort of electronic machine based technologies are a kind of male domain culturally. So is it a little different for women now or do women still have to do kind of like all the other genres and have to sell women and, you know, the LGBTQI plus community as well have to kind of sell sex if they want to be successful DJs. That does depend on the scene actually. Um, mm -hmm. So that's where, that's where, you know, the underground versus mainstream stuff does have some some bearing. Mm. You know, there are scenes where if it's, if the only concern is, is commerce, um, yeah, you're going to get the only women who are DJing look like Barbie, you know. Um, but if you are going for, you know, a scene where people who come along are real, like, long-term dance music fans and come because they like dance music that doesn't really matter that much um and so yeah so you know you get women who can look just as shabby as the early days male djs looked now and it's completely acceptable but again it really does depend where you are in the scene and um yeah it it's it's getting much better it's getting much easier there are many 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 more women playing but um yeah, when I wrote when I wrote the bulk of the book, that was still not the case. And why did the DJ kind of lose sway with in the hip hop genre? I feel like early on in hip hop, the DJ is the star of the show because hip hop does derive from disco, right? Um, and the MC is just kind of a tool of the DJ in early hip hop. And by the time we get to the, I'm talking like late 70s, very early 80s, by the time we get to like 83, 84, the MC now is a star of the show and the DJ is a background character. And the DJ, I feel like, is all but gone uh, from hip hop culture. Um, what happened there where the DJ disappears? Is it is it the advance of these electronic instruments like playback machines? that we get in the 90s like dat playbacks um or is that skill of scratching maybe mixing live um something that doesn't get passed down i think it's because the commercial necessity of recording albums yeah. transfers the actual center of who is the most important contributor from the DJ to the MC, because yeah. the I mean the DJ is actually still more important because frankly the thing that drives people to the MC is the quality of the beat, is beat mm -hmm. production. You know what I'm saying? You yeah. can have a you know a hellified rhyme all day, but if your beat production is kind of weak, no one's going to be driven to the song. But at the same time. I think what happens is that the necessity of recording albums and distributing the music and making it commercially viable requires that the center of attraction shift from the DJ to the MC. That's my theory too. Capitalism. Yeah. Really? I mean, a live performance used to be, if you go back and watch, you know, early live hip hop performances. I'm talking if you can find anything, because let's remember early hip hop stuff is tape trading of people recording live shows. Um, I remember a argument. I met Biz Marquis backstage on tour because him and Cool V were having the lo loudest argument about what was the second hip hop vinyl ever. 
And then it just crossed <laughs> my mind, like, that's a weird conversation. Cause I could, you know, who can answer that question? Because, you know, what's the first? I don't know. But um when you when you think about these performances, it's all DJ based, right? Yeah. And it's that relationship between the MC and the DJ that make them so entertaining and memorable. And what you guys are describing is kind of, for me, where hip hop starts to go to die and get real boring because it's just people either rapping over an instrumental or, or literally rapping over their track with the vocals in it, which is what you see now in most mainstream hip hop performances. Yeah, I think it's it's what what Pascal said, but and I think also like, you know, hip hop became um, a, ma a mainstream genre in as much as it, you know, new versions of it were charting. You know, they were they were in the top in the the top forty or the the pop charts, um, and they, you know, to be on the radio and to be on MTV, uh, you know, the center of gravity was always going to be the the singer. Right, or the, the singing person or the, the vocalist, let's say, because they're maybe a, a rapper. But the DJ is not a very interesting uh, visual kind of center point, I think, <laughs> you know, if you think about what what those forms of media are, are centered around. Um, I don't actually mean that the DJ isn't interesting, but from the perspective of people who are selling music videos and from the perspective of people selling shows and the perspective of um, people selling albums, um, you know, it's it's about the singer and the rapper. And I think like the DJ just kind of fades into the background there, um, you know, so, and it's, there's a reason why the some of the only dance music hits are the ones where there's like a very memorable vocal line, you know, with some exceptions, but typically it's the ones with, with a vocal line that's kind of, that makes it like a pop song basically, right, um, that, that gets kind of, um, into the charts or onto the radio, the ones that are just techno. <laughs> mm -hmm. The groove is in the heart. Yeah. <laughs> the groove is in the heart. Yeah. Well, dance music also is a music that's pretty. Um, what's the word I'm looking for? I can't think right now. Where you just throw it away. You hear it once and throw it away. Disposable. Disposable. Thank you. I couldn't think. Well, dance that? music is probably the most disposable genre of music that I can think of where people don't necessarily go back and listen to dance hits of the eighties. Maybe if you're just going on a nostalgic trip, but when it comes to a DJ rock in the party, you're not going to, you know, pull out some Euro trash from 87. That was popular. Uh, actually, you will. You will? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And yeah. Haro yeah. in with your uh... heads do that. It's yeah. the least disposable in a way. Hmm? Well, dance song is classic. It's a classic forever. The domestic mm. house music scene in America is pretty much an AARP convention. <laughs> it's true. That's true. So, Tammy, I mean, you think you can pull out uh, dance hits from the the mid '80s and? Yeah, totally. I mean, I I play it. You know, the only place I play it at the moment. I have a day job, so I don't play that much anymore. But the only place I do play it when I play um, is pretty much receptive to like the DJ gets to do whatever they want. Like the, the crowd really trusts you, you know, and um, which that's ideal, right? You get to, you get to play that role of maybe playing them completely new things for a while and then playing them a couple of things that they might know and remember from way, way back or, and then maybe some of them are too young to know it. So it's new for them, you know, mm -hmm. um, but it's yeah, you you can definitely. I I play stuff from the last three decades quite regularly. Um, but yeah, I think when I started playing as a resident, like a monthly resident of a club night in the UK, I was definitely buying new music every week for my gigs because I felt like yeah, you, there was there's this sort of pressure to be to to have something that nobody in the crowd's heard before, which is actually the opposite of a lot of other kinds of um, popular music. That's, yeah, that's like dance music one hundred and one, right? Like mm. you're cool because you have something I've never heard before. Exactly. Yeah, and and, and the, none of the other cool. DJs have played it either. Yeah, right. Yeah. right. <laughs> that's, that's that's why I bring that up because there's kind of when we I bring that up because in in some work I'm trying to do for after the 
feature film that I've worked, I'm working on is out, is on the ideas of authenticity. And part of that was researching um, a dance music phenomenon more with like vocalists who weren't credited mm. for, for songs that were big hits in Europe. Yes. And in the 80s and early 90s, everybody knows about Millie Vanilli. Some people know about a group called CNC Music Factory with two producers named Cole and Clovillis. That's where CNC comes from. But those men used the same woman, Martha Wash, for I think three of their four hits that they had under different names of groups with different avatars. Um, mm. And it was all Martha Wash. And her lawsuit actually came to have Congress change a law about crediting artists in songs. But um, part of the reason why people were so kind of down to do this stuff, especially in the, in the mid 80s in Europe, more than anywhere else I saw this in Europe, was that um, they knew the song didn't have a long shelf life. Even Millie Vanilli, when they signed their record deal, they're like, mm, we'll just do this thing. He's paying our bills for a while and then it'll be over. And of course, they go on a much longer ride than they anticipated. Mm -hmm. But that's why I say the idea that dance music is disposable and it doesn't sit with us the same way that, you know, maybe R&B and rock and roll do as far as like classics. Like, is there a classic dance circuit where, I mean, there's a, there's a, I guess we have to get into like micro genres of certain kinds of music, you know, uh, Jocelyn Enriquez and a bunch of other 90s, like Stevie B and all those people. If you're familiar, I don't even know if you're familiar with these artists. Ah, um, I don't know who Stevie B is. You know who Jocelyn Enriquez is, but not Stevie B? <laughs> yeah. But <laughs> Are you effing with me? <laughs> no. <laughs> you know, <laughs> Jesus Christ. I have you some very obscure. You know, superstar and dance music, but you don't know Spring Love Guy? Yeah, but that's because I, I, I you know, being in Australia, we, we we're exposed a bit more to the kind of Asian stuff if we're paying attention to it, you know? So Interesting. Yeah. I'm going to send Jocelyn Enriquez an email and be like, you know, you're famous in Australia. Uh, <laughs> Pascal, I, you know Stevie B. I've, I've, I remember hearing about him in the 90s. I forget the music. You don't know Spring Love? I'm, I'm not very good at names. Me neither. Spring yeah. Love, come yeah. back to me. Okay, I do know that one. <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I'm also really that bad with names. Is a part of a genre of dance music that was very popular in the Latino community in New York in the 80s and 90s, kind of the 70s. It's called freestyle. Lisa yeah. Lisa and the cult jam and all that stuff. That's it was very big. And Steve Yeah, it comes, yeah, it comes out of the Latino. It actually Expose. comes, out, actually yeah. comes yeah. out of the Latino community. In New, York, in New York City. But I remember that as being one of that genre. You weren't allowed to listen to it? Were there like racial fights? Oh, no. Point? Yeah, I remember something. In New York, at least up until recently, I don't know recently, when I was coming up, Blacks and Latinos got along very well. That I've heard that's changed a lot recently, but at least mm -hmm. when I was growing up, there was not the same kind of racial tension that you have in, uh, in uh, the West Coast between Blacks and Mexicans. Was there racial tension on the dance floor in Australia? Oh, um, different kind of racial tension. Um, I mean, so I just remember that bouncers wouldn't let people in to clubs, you know, that and, and really, then, yeah. And, and then there were like clubs where it would be mostly not white people and then clubs where it would be mostly white people. And it was mostly divided by genre. So like the R and B club, right. Um, was, I, I used to, you know, go dancing to R&B when I was in my undergraduate years. And uh, that was the most multicultural dance floor that you would get here. So so if DJ Tammy Tam is DJing at the spot in Australia and some brown people want to go, the bodyguard would be like, hold up. Uh, not any, well, not where I DJ now, but okay. the, some of the places that I went to in Sydney in like mm, early 2000s. Really? Yeah. Definitely, like they would, but they would use the shoes as a way of um, turning people away. They uh, use the dress code. Uh, the dress code is the yeah. dress code class repression. It's both, I think. Yeah, yeah. So, like, 
because I do remember specifically there were like there was a gap of maybe three guys um and so one guy wasn't let in because of his shoes allegedly and then three guys later a guy had the same shoes and was let in <laughs> so you know and that that was um and they they yeah they one of them the 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 guy at the back was much paler so that was Actually, definitely a thing i wanted to ask you a question tammy you refer to dance music in your book as an industry. I found that very fascinating, the way that you basically categorized it as an industry. Why not a culture as opposed to an industry? Not that I disagree. I just found that very interesting. Mm, I think it's both. Um, I think it's both. I think it depends what you're talking about in relation to dance music. So you can definitely talk about it as a culture or a set of cultures um, and, you know, cultures that, are centered around particular music dancing music and dancing practices that center around a dj um and you know particular things that are in common with each other but also and and drugs a lot <laughs> um and um and and then there's also the fact that it it is an industry like you know as soon as you work in a, in any capacity that um you know it it survives during moments when like live instrumental music doesn't necessarily thrive. You'll still have the venues that are that continue their DJ nights while that's while those kind of dips are happening in, in other kinds of music. And presumably it's because they're profitable. I, mean, I can't imagine why else, <laughs> right? Yeah. Um, I don't think it's to do with like musical prejudices. I think people like live music, you know. But um, this is this is not true in the city that I live in now, which is a very a very kind of strongly live music city. But um, during the global financial crisis, I lived in um, in the UK, and it was like yeah, bands suffered more than DJs did during that period in terms of getting gigs. Um, and it, yeah, it's, it's still to this day that, uh, bands definitely suffer more than DJs. Uh, there's definitely venues that I grew up going to that would have live music. Some of the best shows I've seen in my young 46 years of life were at Blake's in Berkeley that changed their name. And once they changed their name, they're like, no more live music. We're only going to have DJs. Yeah. I mean, you have to pay more people with bands, right? So not necessarily. I suppose not necessarily. You could be a one a one person band. Um, well, I mean, you just don't have to, the band has to pay more people, but the club is like, look, we're giving you fifty bucks. We're giving you fifty bucks. That's true. That's very very true. We don't, we don't give a shit how many of you is there. If you want to be Earth, Wind, and Fire, y'all Negroes better learn how to split this fifty dollars. <laughs> <laughs> but <laughs> but <laughs> you didn't think about that, did you, Pants Uh But no, dan dance music is just, it seems like it's a safer investment. That's why you see so much of the investment in the promotion of it as well, too. Yeah. I mean, on one level, you don't need, I mean, unless you're talking about people being attracted to specific genres, which of course is a thing, mm -hmm. like a lot of people within a certain age bracket will just go out and do that after a night out of drinking with friends in a pub um, without thinking twice about like, you know, I'm going because I'm making a particular musical choice. They're going, they're going out because it's a place to go dance after they're drunk. You know, it's, <laughs> it's um, yeah, I think, I think there's something about it where it fits into the broader nightlife and entertainment industry in a way that um, maybe live music requires more, I don't know. There's something more deliberative about it, potentially. I'm not sure. I'm just just now, making now, stuff up now. <laughs> now, electronic music and live music. I, I think I think there is an interesting, especially pivot, because as music becomes this ubiquitous thing, right? We we don't have to save our money, buy a record, and clean our house to one album. Um, it, like, well, Tammy's younger than us, so we maybe she had a, a multi-disc changer at her. Mm -hmm. Oh no! Oh, it was just the same Lawrence Welk over and over. <laughs> <Lawrence> <laughs> the same Chopin over and over. But uh, but you know, th there's a there's a time in your life as a younger person where you know music means a lot more to you because it's part of these the soundtracks of different you know the 
uh, monumental moments of your life, right? Yeah. And now music is just something that we have so much access to. Mm -hmm. Damn near everything in recorded history is in my phone uh, due to a storage locker app that I have on it. And I can just dial up, you know, Steely Dan's first record and, and play it, but mix it with 12 other things when it's over. I don't have to flip anything over or, or find something else after it's done. It seems like um, the DJ culture in in live in places where live music existed, you know, is is serving that same purpose. It's just kind of endless music, especially without word, lyrics in it or, or or singing in it. So it can kind of continue to be that background noise to your life that we're so used to to having. Mm -hmm. How does that affect? dance production, especially with things like AI. I start to show off, there's an AI thing we have on this app that we, we use, and it just creates a music based on a genre. Hmm. How does this wow. affect people that actually create electronic music when you have the ability to, I don't even have to pay a DJ anymore, I can just AI music in my, in my establishment, and these people will dance to anything anyway because they're not used to caring about music mm. yeah i don't i don't know i'll be interested to see if ai makes that that particular kind of impact in a way that's any different from the other kind of progressions toward automation that we've had technologically um you know i suppose i suppose it will it will for some places whose primary goals are a profit and that's you know that's kind of an inevitable part of this it's um any any way you can replace a human that you have to pay um a capitalist <laughs> will uh but at the same time i think there will be an a kind of insistence or a doubling down as a response to that as there frequently is as responses to technological advancements and I think, I think people will crave the human, both the human presence that comes from having a real person doing those things, but also arguably just better choices because, um, you know, it's one thing to choose an, an opening track for a, um, for a show as background music, but if you're going to have that as the backdrop to people dancing in a social setting. I'm not sure. I don't know. I, maybe AI will be able to do it just as well, but I, I don't know. I think there's something about the DJ, like literally responding on a human level to people on the dance floor. Um, that's certainly how it is for me. So I, I don't know how it's possible for AI oh, I mean, to do that. I, I think me personally, and I don't say this with any sort of joy, Mm. I say this with extreme like pessimism mm. and sadness. I feel like people just become used to certain things and it's totally cool with them. Yeah, and that's probably you, true. And you can even, you know, again, as someone that's worked in festivals, they definitely monitor certain points of the night mm -hmm. when the crowd is hype and when things start to go down. So you could ultimately program, okay, this is the peak people come in even when they're taking drugs we realize that they're peaking at this moment mm. so this is where we want the music to go this is where do, 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 and then we know that needs it doom 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 right here mm -hmm. doom 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 all night from this point on and this gets the people dancing and then we're going to slow it down because that's when they start to, to go to the bar and, and buy alcohol like i agree that the human aspect to all that makes everything much more inter entertain much more fun <laughs> entertaining um but the the kind of the reality is that i feel like that goes becomes like vinyl for a lot mm. of where it becomes a cool experience for certain people that want to be cool like i went to the real dj thing with a human hmm yeah maybe um but i also just i'm not sure that people are uniform enough to for AI to be able to actually even do a decent a half decent job of the things you just described. Like I'm I'm yet to be convinced that it's that it's capable of that. <laughs> um, you know, and 
But maybe it will. I don't know. We'll see. But like, you know, if you're talking about like, say, a club that has 300 people in it, mm -hmm. um, who have all arrived at a different time with different people, there may be different ages, different genders, different backgrounds. They've taken their drugs at different times. <laughs> um, you know, I think that's like a human can still make a kind of can can to get an oversight from mm -hmm. observing a crowd of lots of variation i can ai do that maybe i don't Look, know i'm pro human i don't know <laughs> I'm, yeah <laughs> i'm all I'm, I'm pro human in this conversation um you know as i just recorded a song and i and i used uh, a little bit of of ai created drum patterns and there's definitely a massive difference between a human feel for for uh, drum fills hmm. that you can't program um, even if it's playing to whatever it is you're playing right there's just something about the human feel yeah. uh, that being said it's surprising what we get used to when we're not you know really cognizant of what it is for sure yeah i mean i my students think that i don't notice when they use ai to write their essays <laughs> I, I notice. <laughs> AI makes up sources still. Which Does it really? Thing. Yeah. Mm. Makes up sources that don't exist. Like it makes up sources that could plausibly exist, but don't. That's what's weird. Like That's hilarious. AI sounds like Cuba. <laughs> <laughs> ah, wow. I told you about that, right, Pascal? Cuba, they said at his wedding, Cuba used to make up wars that didn't exist for his teachers in high school. Oh, oh my God. And write, and write papers on them and get A's. That's amazing. That's hilarious. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, did you want to add something, Pascal? No, uh, I, I, uh, I'm really uh, in entertained by the... I, the notion that you grew up several years after us, learned DJing on the vinyl, became a scholar of dance music, to, <laughs> to write a book of the, I, I'm thoroughly fascinated by the sequence of timing and events. And you teach this in the university, right? Uh, so I teach, um, it's a bit complicated. I, I teach um, in an area pop, called popular music studies. Um, and, but I work in a department that, or in a in a sort of degree program um, that's a Bachelor of Arts with a major in music industry. So um, these are students who aren't necessarily practicing musicians. Some of them, many of them are, they come in already musicians, but we're not there to teach them the practice of music or even the theory of music. We teach them the sort of we, we give them a sort of general overview of, of music in the world and, or music industry. And then we have industry people coming in actually doing studio stuff with them or teaching them like the practical business elements of music. So my job in particular is I'm teaching them the kind of social and cultural study of music, the stuff that they resent that they have to learn. And they're like, excuse me, how is this relevant to me? Like starting my own record label and, you know, these sorts of things. Your record label's going to suck. Yeah, that's what it's relevant to. <laughs> <laughs> you got a shitty taste in music and your pants suck. You're teaching, <laughs> a, you're teaching a bunch of wannabe Sean Combs, basically. That like. sounds like a nightmare. Especially <laughs> because they're all white. They're not actually. They're not, they're not. It's um. We have a very very diverse in every sense um cohort. Uh, I'm in a university that's like because we have a lot of universities in Melbourne and there's the the sandstone one which is sort of the the well known one that people who get high grades go to, um and it's the older one as well. And then we have one that was, you know, that's the next one down, and then and then we're below that. And then you teach at the hood one. <laughs> there's there's actually like two more even there's even more hood ones? yeah yeah but um picture every student looking like sean combs from now on i can't even, <laughs> I can't even understand what a hood in australia looks like I don't no know. no I don't no, know what no a hood it's, in australia it's, looks like. it's more that we're known as the kind of um like it's rmit so you know royal melbourne institute of technology so it is a kind of i guess mit <laughs> in a way um but yeah, people come because they want to do more vocationally focused degrees rather than academic or kind of intellectual degrees, which that that's hard if you're trained academically and have to teach these students because a lot of them resent that they have to 
learn that background stuff and you know teaching them how to research and write a lot of them just don't want to do that they want to be in the studio all the time so they they get really annoyed that i make them write essays they want to be in the studio all the time making hits yep making have you ever hits. told someone that their music isn't good like that <laughs> the movie with the drummer the jazz oh guy? god ever, that's like, so brutal like, hey this isn't good dude this is i would i can't play this. trash tammy dj tammy tam can't play this and just speak in the third person <laughs> <laughs> If Tammy Tam can't play this, what do you? No, that's not what you do. I no, I stick, I steer clear of the um of the making side of things with them. I I used to be a piano teacher, and I yeah, just don't. I don't teach people the practice of music anymore. I'm done with that for as much as I can manage. The paper chase thing. Look to your left. <laughs> Look to uh, your right. My maternal grandmother was a piano teacher. Is wow. Yes. <laughs> Tammy can't play the jammy. <laughs> That's what you to say. Tammy can't play the jammy. Sorry. <laughs> have you ever heard anyone make some music that made you go, "This is really good. You have a lot of potential. I'm going I'm to steal this." Uh, no, because they just they're in such a different realm of like they just have a completely different pool of musical knowledge and interest that they draw on from me in the first place so it's almost like a parallel universe i can really appreciate some of the things that they do but i just don't know any of the reference i don't listen to what they listen to i don't know any how of the references be, how many want to be kanye oh um <laughs> none i <Yeah>. don't think <laughs> not, not, today, not today's kanye maybe 2010 kanye so, maybe 2010 kanye yeah, yeah. not today's kanye no no but he does get a lot of uh we, we do talk about a lot of you know current pop culture stuff because it's relevant to some of the questions i ask them so um as yeah as bad as kanye has become we can't deny he's a pretty good producer in his early career he put out some interesting mm -hmm. tammy yeah. doesn't want to agree like tammy tam no he wasn't playing kanye at the, at the club i wasn't playing kanye at the club but i was probably dancing to early kanye he just, you know, I feel like everyone, the theory is that when his mom passed away, he kind of took a downward dive that he never mm. recovered from. You know, he's always been the most arrogant man. In he is. He's, that's it. But that, you know, that's kind of a millennial thing, though. You know that, Jason. He's older than me. Is he really? He's a year older than me. Yeah. Oh, then there's no excuse. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, that dude's... Uh, Horrible, horrible. No, I think the, the the argument I've heard is that his mom, he had one of those moms that was like, baby, you can be whatever you want to be. You are just perfect the way you are. You have all God's grace in you, and you will be an amazing <laughs> everything in the world. And he took that literally. <laughs> I mean, he succeeded in it. It's not like he's not a billionaire. It's I mean, like, listen, you know. there's, not, there's something to be said about having parents who are affir affirming. You don't want, you know, if you're a kid, you do kind of like want parents to affirm your ability to do things. I think there's a point where it can be, you know, over the top. But, you know, there are things to be said for parents to affirm your ability to succeed in the world or in whatever way you want or do do what you can i mean tammy you've taught people piano and as a piano teacher i'm sure you dealt with a lot of it's almost like being a like a football coach mm. you're gonna deal with people that can't do it but their parents want them to do it more than they want to do it yep um how many people have come across you as a piano teacher and you were like you just you close the piano and you're like let's just read a book you seem no. let's read a book um, turn off the metronome you're like just just stop listen it was my things? income i would teach anyone it was my income um you know if, even if it was glorified babysitting i would still i would still take the job tammy's a hustler <laughs> you have to be you have to be i mean if uh, she wants to keep djing and buying all those crazy pants <laughs> <laughs> I just pictured Tammy just like ripping off the outfit she's wearing now. And it's just those raver pants from Hot Topic. And just glow sticks fall from the ceiling. Dun, 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 
<laughs> Amazing. Like that's not a background behind Tammy. Those are real lasers. Like that's the way she lives her life. So, yeah. <laughs> she wrote a she wrote a book about dance culture. You think that's a fucking background? Those are real lasers. <laughs> that sweater she's wearing is a lie. There is some yeah. Mad Max shit underneath that. <laughs> You're very into Mad Max at the moment. And, I am uh, really into Thunderdome, <laughs> and I need to come to Australia, and I need to have you DJ the Thunderdome party. I mean, that's that would be the most badass party ever. And, I, and I'm also terrified of Australia. Why? The animals. Yeah, yeah. Like I said, I've been watching too many of your movies. Oh, I'm traumatized by the settler colonial yeah. nature of the history. <laughs> <laughs> so the u.s is not 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 there it's different different mm. yeah, yeah rock and roll right have you been to canada it's probably very similar just warmer canada is the most woke settler colonial country <laughs> true i think derek varn is on the wrong thing because i see derek varn and norm finkelstein on the bottom of our screen. And I have what? no idea why either person is on the screen. And so I crazy. want so bad to turn it on because I think they Bring might have in. had a conversation. <laughs> I'm gonna I'm gonna do something that both of these guys are gonna yell at me about. But since <laughs> I'm in I'm not in New York right now or Utah, I feel very comfortable getting yelled at by Derek Vard and Norm Finkelstein for doing <laughs> because neither one can beat the shit out of me. And I've met Norm in real life, and don't let the age fool you. That man is in shape. Yes. I, Norm, I, I put some money on Norm Finkelstein be able to beat your ass. Norm Finkelstein <laughs> might slap the shit out of me because you're not going to see it coming. I can see it. I can see that because Tucson met Norm. I okay. did. Derek, Norm, why are you people here? I honestly don't know. <laughs> <laughs> It's your birthday, fool. <laughs> <laughs> Professor Finkelstein, how are you? The more I listen, the more, the more I wonder why I'm here. <laughs> <laughs> We're here to celebrate the friend and host of This Is The Revolution podcast, our beloved Jason Mile. Oh, my God. Okay, I didn't see that one coming. I did not see that one coming at all. I looked at him. Today is Jason's birthday, Professor Finkelstein. Uh huh. <laughs> Don't seem so excited, Professor Finkelstein. I know Ben Burgess called me up and he told me to appear on the program, but I didn't quite get why. And being an ob obedient servant, I just did as I was told. <laughs> you seem as excited as you seem. <laughs> well, I honestly don't have much time because originally I was informed to be on at 4.30, so I moved my appointments up to the early afternoon. However, I did want to use the okay, this occasion not for myself, but to present to Jason and also to Pascal, a song that throughout my life has given me inspiration in dark moments and which neither of you have, maybe, I don't know, neither of you have heard. So I'm gonna use my brief time to play this song for you and then we'll see if there is any appreciation of it or contrary wise depreciation of me so with your permission here it goes we don't hear it you can't hear it you can't hear it mm -mm. no Oh, how do you, you have a phonograph in there, Norm? <laughs> <laughs> One second. One second. I know what the miracles of technology. 
I'm told anything is possible. So if I send you now mm -hmm. the URL, how do mm -hmm. I how do I send it? Is there a the, there's a private chat on the screen? You can actually send it on the private chat and then Tsan can play it. There's a private chat on the bottom of the screen. There we go. Someone in the chat just said, not gonna lie, I just clicked on the stream and was not expecting Norman Finkelstein to be <laughs> on, on a video called The History of Dance Music. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm playing this first of all as a source of inspiration, but also, if I'm allowed to say so, mm -hmm. I'm sometimes a little bit disappointed that with Cornell West's uh, very impressive range in his knowledge of music, he never mentions this person. And also, if you listen to his interviews, as I frequently do, he never mentions Mahalia Jackson, which I find mm. disappointing. Mm. He doesn't mention. Did you get the song? Uh, Tucson, did you see that? Do you see the link, Tucson? Is it in the, pri it's let in the me private see. chat? It's in the private chat. Can you can you pull that up, please? Okay. Yes, I can. We got it, Norm. Uh, maybe maybe and you know what's funny? It's funny that you say that norm because cornell came up in a church and every church i was in as a young kid had the fans was it like this for you too pascal where there was fans in the church um and mahalia jackson was being the fan that's how i knew who she was no man i grew up in uh attending catholic churches and oh. and episcopal churches so that we you didn't stand have... up sit down okay yeah oh it's, it's, stand up, sit down. it's hard to imagine somebody with this range not being familiar with Mahalia Jackson. He hasn't mentioned her. He doesn't mention the person who you're going to hear now, hopefully through the miracles of technology. We, we should we should call him out for that. And the third person he always mentions in his litany of heroes, he'll mention Edward Said. But I've never once heard him mention Noam Chomsky. And that's mm. surprising also. Do they have beef? I don't know. Uh, honestly, I don't know. But uh, I, Cornell and I are exactly the same age. And so we pass through the same eras, epochs. And it's hard to imagine how he could be omitting Chomsky. He also almost never mentions, and I find that also very disappointing, he never mentions Bob Moses. He does mention Fannie Lou Hamer. He does mention sometimes Diane Nash. He mentions, um, oh, what's her name? Uh, the person who, the senior person who organized Nick. Um, Ella Baker. Oh, yeah, he'll mention Ella Baker. He never mentions Bob Moses. And I, I find that really very disappointing as well. I know there's a limit to how many people you can mention, but uh, these people were really very impressive. Did you watch his, his appearance on our show? Yes, I watched your. I was mm -hmm. the senior interviewer in that. I watched. I watched it. I probably watched it twice. Look, he's good, and that's why I'm disappointed because he is first rate. He is top notch. His range is, by any reckoning, his range is dazzling. No question in my mind about that. Uh, oh, okay. Paul Robeson. Okay, so let's hear it. This is one of my. This is one of my faves. This guy. Why are you bringing out Negro spirits? It's first, it's first. 
I didn't know that song. Did you know that song, Pascal? No, I didn't know this one. Um, I'm a big fan of Paul Robeson. No, you should hear it to the end. Just hear a few more lyrics. A few more lyrics. <laughs> Not really. You play it too sad. Sometimes I'm up, sometimes I'm down. Bear the burden in the heat of the day. Sometimes my soul feels a heavenly boom, bear the burden in the heat of the day. I'm gonna bear, Lord, bear with the world, yes. Some come cripple and some come lame. Burden in the heat of the day. Some come walking in Jesus' name. Yes, we're right here. So you heard what he said. Some come crippled, some come lame, bear the burden in the heat of the day. Some come walking in Jesus' name, bear the burden in the heat of the day. In other words, we all have burdens to bear. And when you're feeling down about yourself, remember some come to this world some come crippled, some come lame, and then some, like Robeson, uh, he ended up, uh, he ended up, some come, some come walking in Jesus' name, and he stood by his beliefs, and he ended up a destroyed man, a person of extraordinary physical stature. And when you look at the pictures of him after he went into seclusion, roughly at the age of 61, uh, you look at, there are, there are a few, just a few pictures of him in those years. It's as if his whole, excuse me, it's as if his whole body had caved in. It's such a, it's such a shattering sight. And that's why, it annoys me a little bit that Cornell West doesn't invoke his name and then invoke his sacrifices, uh, his beliefs. Uh, and I've always found him in his greatness and also in his twilight. I found him, his person, his example, a great source of personal inspiration. So I pass that on to you on your birthday. Bear the burden in the heat of the day. And just since I understand the woman on before me, she's from Australia. Is that correct? Uh, that is correct, yes. 
if you want to see something really magnificent, with all due respect to Australians, I don't know much about them, uh, but there is a, dis a decisive racist streak in Australians, which is, uh, you know, it's part of its history. And uh, I'm just, the, the reason I mentioned that is if you go on YouTube, you'll find a really special um, video of Robeson performing between, before Australian workers. I've seen this one, yeah. And there's such a genuine mutual love and respect and yeah. feeling of honor that the great Paul Robeson comes to a construction site, a building site, to perform for the workers. It was the Sydney Opera House. They were building the Sydney Opera House. Oh, workers. I yeah. didn't know that at all. Yeah. And wherever he sang, he would sing at the, you know, the most distinguished uh, houses of arts. Uh, and then he would have a separate performance for the workers uh, to give them access to his musical genius. And it's a it's a double you know it's a, a double source of pride first of all that Robeson goes to them but also the reverence here is a black man the sheer reverence they feel for him mm. uh, it's a very special thing to behold it's so on a moral level it's so head and shoulders above this woke shit we're living through now. <laughs> Thank you so oh, much, Norm. Norm. Norm you're <laughs> Thank you so today, much for that. Norm, you're coming in hot, brother. <laughs> you're coming in hot. Norm, you're the, the hot, hot stepper Finkelstein, once again. You come well, that's, that's how I feel. I feel that everything we're seeing now is uh, in the name of leftism is actually a radical right gangrene on what the whole left tradition stood for. Oh, no, can I ask you a question? Yeah. Have you ever pos have you ever possibly considered that one of the reasons why this woke shit, particularly the woke shit coming out of black spaces is so bad, is because the class tendency of the folks using it is that they're not working class black people? I totally agree with that. I, look, I totally agree with that. Unfortunately, it's being pawned off as something leftist. And that, to me, is the most depressing aspect of it. The left tradition obviously has many things that, you know, there's grounds to feel embarrassed about, ashamed of. You know, there is terrible things that happen in the name of the left. But there is also a genuinely heroic and inspiring tradition of which Paul Robeson represented in the 20th century, he represented the peak. And uh, it's a tradition which, especially in my latter years, I've done everything I can to salvage and pass on by telling people, this is what the left used to mean. This is what it used to stand for. It's a black man performing for white workers and the white workers revering this black man as one of their own and proud that he's one of their own. It was a source of pride that Paul Robeson identified on the left for people on the left, white leftists. It was a source of pride that Paul Robeson identified with them. No, can Thank I ask you, you another question? No, you can't, Pascal. <laughs> um, <laughs> We actually have a lot of people who would like to come through and give birthday salutations. We appreciate your your contributions so much. <laughs> can, I, can I just say, I have two points of connection with Norm before he goes that I want to mention. Sure. Uh, one is the, um, the Paul Robeson connection. I'm actually about to interview the author of a book on Paul Robeson, uh, an Australian author um, oh. of, a, of a book on Paul Robeson, a beautiful book that he wrote in 2018. Um, and uh, he starts the book with that anecdote about the about Paul Robeson singing to those workers at the Sydney Opera House, and uh, I learned a lot from that book. And um, the uh, the other thing I wanted to say, because the first thing you opened with was racist Australians, which was was awesome. Um, <laughs> I uh, 
I um I'm I'm a fellow Jew, so yeah, so we have we have that in common. <laughs> okay, well, so so nice to be present for Mr. Miles Milestone, and uh, thank you to Ben Burgess for having the consideration to invite me. And I wish you all the very, very best. And Miles, I hope I see you in person again. We will see each other again, hopefully before the year's over. Okay. Absolutely. Thank Bye you so much, Norm. Hey, I appreciate you, brother. It's my honor and my pleasure. Thank you so, so much. Thank you. Norm Frankenstein, everybody. Just, just to let you guys know, Norm is a real friend that I actually do conversate with outside of the show. It's not like he just, you know, he, he will hit me up and, you know, the same bitching you see on the screen, I get that same bitching in private. So. Glad to I, hear it. I, I, I appreciate that man a lot. I learn a lot from that guy. So I, I appreciate that. Who else is there? I'm not even going to look. I'm not going to look. Good. Don't. I'm at who's coming on. Oh, oh shit. It's Jordan <laughs> Dugan. That's right. Hello. Hello, all. Hello, Tammy. Thank you. Hello, Varn, the silent. Wonderful to see you. I saw Derek Barn on the screen. I was like, fuck is going I was like, oh, did Gene fuck me. up? I get no, I get no, 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 we've been planning this for a little while. Um, <laughs> although you have a very Hebraic um, reception today. <laughs> That's right. Oh my. Is, that, is that like a way to say, oh, the Jews are here for Jason? We can just yes, go to like Abrahamic exactly and include Pascal. As well, at least. <laughs> is that what you're trying to say? Uh, oh, look who's here for Jason's birthday. Jordan, Norm, Varn, and now Tammy is telling us the Jew truth. <laughs> the truth. We have a lot of guests actually on the way. How many can we get on screen at a time? Let's make this a party. Nine. Yalla. Nine? Is that real? I don't know. Opa. We'll, we'll find out. Who's that? I can't see. It's yeah. Stefan. <laughs> oh my goodness, it's Stefan. Bertram Lee. Can I can I like play Chief Keith now or something? <laughs> Please. <laughs> There's a scene in the first Revenge of the Nerds movie where um you know they the only fraternity that would have them was a black fraternity. Yes. Uh, led by Bernie Casey. And uh so when the black fraternity heads come into the nerds party they play a paul robeson singing uh old man river or something they play an old negro spiritual yeah they play an old negro spiritual i mean it's it's a uh, it's a pretty no one no one figures thing comes on this is revolution podcast playing old negro spirituals man that's a that's a really it's for jason's birthday that's a that's a beautiful you know i i look uh, Toussaint loves joking with me about the jobs that I've had and all this shit that I've done, but when that happens, I can s say I've I've lived a life. This is true. <laughs> I've lived a life. I got Norm Finkelstein and Stefan the Freedom Fighter on the same <laughs> stream. I was talking right. about you, right. somebody. For Stephane. your birthday, comrade. For your birthday. Remember? Only the best, exactly. Diverse as, as possible. Do you know that you share a birthday with Bill Clinton? Yes. That's just, oh, come on, man. Why would you got to bring that up? That's not a nice thing. I, my dad told me that. And, and I also so share a birthday, birthday with John Stamos. No one ever wants to bring that up. Me and Sorry. Stamos have a very similar energy. Dude, you I do not... so? I will no, I rebuke, no, no. I rebuke no. the whole Bill Clinton thing, man. <laughs> John Stamos and your energy are similar because of middle age. That that about, that might because be we it. both refuse to age. Uh -huh. I'll oh, drink to that. Barn is in the house. Drinking the well into my 40s now. <laughs> I mean, Clinton looks 10 times more like shit than anyone here, like by an enormous margin. Bill Clinton, when he, stopped, when he stopped being president, age kicked him right in the ass yeah. like he, have you seen this really thing that him? like apart from obama like all the presidents since what 1992 have been born in 1948 is that true yeah, really like clinton bush trump and biden are all the same age insane are they wait no is that true anyways you making shit up over there 
Biden is a little bit older than Trump. You fight in one libertarian army and all of a sudden you just make up. Maybe, facts maybe, about US maybe they're not exactly the same age, but they're all like basically the same, like the same generation or whatever. No, they're, just, they're, they're all born in like yes. a three. Mm. They're all born in like a four year range, actually, between 1946 and 1949. That's Look, yeah, I've, I've, I've got half true facts. Biden was, according to Quinn, Biden was 142. Andy yeah, Williams. but I didn't look up Biden. I looked up uh, Bush, Clinton, and Hillary Clinton and Trump. Yeah, they're getting older by like one one year each time. <laughs> oh, the vampire baby boomers. Actually, they're lost generationers, aren't they? I don't know. Yeah, yeah right. Obama is a late baby boomer. Obama was born in the sixties. Allegedly, yeah, I didn't didn't clear him. Allegedly. I don't think Although he is related to George W. Bush distantly, maternally, um, yeah, and that I've checked out on his maternal side. I, I don't think Obama was born anywhere. I think he was created in some kind yeah, of liberal you know, lab. Jordan, <laughs> Jordan, I watched Jordan. <laughs> That's my birth. I, I want to change the subject. I watched. I was Jordan. about to say this is the weirdest birthday conversation. I watched Jordan ever. make a birthday cake for her father that she <laughs> was literally sweating over. True. Did you make a birthday cake for me? For you, She's like, um, you know? yeah, you know, once the hurricane comes and destroys us all, I will <laughs> get that down to you for sure. Jordan has made you a cake, but she's forced to eat it all by herself. <laughs> yeah, the, the of the internet. Exactly. Is the is the Quinn turn on the screen? Holy That's shit! Right. Yo, 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 what's up? I'm here to bring up the Jew ratio. <laughs> Oh, wow. <laughs> you forgot Quinn. Aren't you like uh, not all Jew, like part Jew? Um, Only the that's why he said ratio. <laughs> wow. We'll I'm be able to Jew bless either. you. Soon. Yeah, I mean, like, I am on my dad's side. Oh, that doesn't count, right? I mean, no, not to the, the, the I, 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 I went into the little pool now. with the rabbis. It counts. <laughs> oh, okay. Stefan, there's no Jew anywhere near you, right? Uh, God, dude. He's surrounded. What are you talking about? <laughs> <He's surrounded. laughs> I know we have all our Jewish friends here on the Sabbath. Uh, that's right. Yeah, that's true. Actually, can, can you, all breaking Sabbath. Can you imagine Badly. if someone's just like scrolling by and they just hear me and Pascal yelling at Jews with a bunch of white people on the screen? Well, we thought that's what you wanted you for your birthday. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I mean, it's up to you, is. Jason. It kind of is. <laughs> so it's letting people in. I don't even know who's waiting anymore. Yeah, yeah okay. all right. Well, I'm going to make some room for other people. And uh, enjoy yourselves, friends. Happy birthday, Jason. Thank you. I will see you shortly. Yes. Because we're going to be doing live in studio with Ben Burgess. Woo -woo! That's right. And Bye. I will expect a chocolate, chocolate birthday cake. No coconut in yours. Don't worry. No coconut. Bye. Why? <laughs> Why? Is that some Australian shit? You people like coconut in your chocolate cakes? Are you kidding? Coconut's the best thing ever. Oh, it's keep it out of my chocolate cake. <laughs> God damn it. I'm segregating cakes. All right. Who on Man the screen? Oh, shit. It was like a Chinese restaurant on Christmas in here for a hot minute, I tell you. <laughs> wow. Can I just say, who is calling Norm Finkelstein? Who is here? That phone is always ringing. Who's calling that man? He's busy. <laughs> He's busy. He's a busy man. Don't call him. <laughs> I, mean, I, think it, I think it really added to his ambiance that he was constantly getting called on a phone. That yeah, yeah, he's talking. About yes. Here's this beautiful song I love for X Y Z. Phones ringing. What? It, it's like name that tune on the other line. What? What? What is this? <laughs> anyway, thank you, uh, Jason. Up, happy birthday. Thank happy you birthday, very much. stream. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. How are Jordan, you? Good. Jordan worked very hard, uh, you know, putting all this together, and uh, you blew the surprise by uh, being curious. So <laughs> very the Jason biggest... Miles on brand. <laughs> I was I was hanging back on the previous screen to get to like a birthday moment, but then but then um, Vaughn and and Norman were just in yeah. here. So yeah, yeah. Was, uh, <laughs> it's like he found out about the surprise party because like he spotted someone like you know in the hallway, like in the window. Why are they here? <laughs> What are they doing? Well, Gene Bajlan does this thing where when he wants to fuck with us, he just comes on and just, uh, you know, kind of just messes with people. So I was sure. I was afraid it was Bajlan just trying to fuck with us. And I looked at it, I was like, why is Derek Barnum here? No, it, was, it was actually an expression of love. So I, I see where you'd be confused. 
<laughs> that was my first. I was just trying to protect the sanctity. Yeah, yeah. You got you to guess. She's t- talking some interesting stuff. You want to make sure there's no nonsense going on. And then uh, here comes all the nonsense. And, so and the go. guest is actually in Australia. In it's it's know. four o'clock in the morning. I, 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 I heard and got surprised Norm Finkelstein uh, dropped too of, you know, hey. Racism, yeah, <laughs> that was amazing. <laughs> Throwing bombs down under, coming in hot. <laughs> it's true. <laughs> Australia has a lot of racism, but it was not something I was expecting from Norm Finkelstein. Norm it was the hot pick like, committee on that phone. Call like, Hello, how are you, ma'am? Have you yelled at any Aboriginal people today? <laughs> oh God, I like that he also found time to compa- complain about Cornell West. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. No, there's always time to complain. That's for sure. Yeah, yeah. You make time for that. <laughs> Oh, shit. Uh, yeah, yeah. So we got Hollywood Squares. Uh, I was going to say, my, my initial joke was going to be that Varn was Jim J. Bullock. But uh, <laughs> that, that would have doesn't fly anymore. He's not on screen now. But uh, uh, Stefan, I, I, I just don't know you that well. I wouldn't, I wouldn't uh, do that to you. If you would have hit him with the Jim J. Bullock reference. I was ready. <laughs> Jeff, Jason, I'm, I'm, being, I'm being chivied off, off stage. So I'm going to go. <laughs> Hey, Stefan, take care. Bye, Stefan. Take care, man. Stefan is an uh, underappreciated member of the crew. You know, Stefan does a show with Ben Burgess pretty much every Sunday. And that show, while it doesn't do the biggest numbers on the visual podcast, does really good numbers on the audio podcast. People apparently really like the philosophy talk with those two. It's a good show, and he just got bumped by the dude who wrote Criminal Hypnosis. (laughs) So there you go. <laughs> who, it's a banner they, day for Stefan, let me tell you. Uh, what is that in front of you, Quinn? Uh, the microphone or the fake birthday cake? The fake birthday cake. Yeah, the microphone. Oh, that's don't know what that is. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I got your birthday cake. He, he's been crafting that. It was like bouncing around the screen and stuff. It was, it was, it was uh, quite the effects legend. I'm I'm pretty excited to leave here if if all is Real well in Mexico. Pro AV work right here. Yeah, exactly. Production values are off the chain. It's like a Charles Band movie in here. <laughs> <laughs> Code and Neutron, real quick, you have new music out. I do. Yeah, yeah. I, I, sure, we can talk about that. Yeah, uh, Adult Prom, uh, split LP with the band Lung. Uh, that is just up for pre-orders. Will be out into the world at large October sixth. We got a West Coast tour. Coming up close as I'm getting to you, Jason's going to be LA. So, if you give me enough close, notice, I can get up. I'm giving you notice now, son. I'm, I'm on the show. Me, look, <laughs> notice to me. Look, I get it. I get it. Yeah, you, you got like, like a singing. Hey, Tammy, this guy needs a singing telegram to like know when the shows are happening. So. <laughs> I'll, do, I'll do my best. If 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 it's not in a calendar, and I get that calendar reminder. Well, and so what's interesting, a lot of your viewers, I mean, you, you tend to mention it when I introduce and I, you know, I, I guess uh, hosted the show with Pascal at one point. So I'm not a totally unknown commodity, but you have indeed played music with me. You have been in Kona Neutron and the Secret Friends. You, uh, a lot of people don't even realize that you play music until you like do drop your, uh, what is it? Black Yacht Rock? Was that what the, the, the new one that came Black out? Yacht Rock, dude. Yeah. <laughs> Which Pascal uh, but, is furious with, by the way. He, oh man, he's 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 alarmingly quiet. I think he's saving it up because the genre does not exist. There's no such thing. <laughs> he created the name just to bother me. <laughs> well, that seems like mission accomplished to me. And the band. <laughs> you know, you know how when you're thinking of a song title, Conan. Yeah, yeah. And like, uh, I don't, I don't, Tammy, I don't know if you're the same way. I do this all the time, and then I make songs out of them. It's crazy. You, you, okay, yeah. Effort. So yeah. I don't know if you guys are the same way. When I when I'm saving something, uh-huh. I, we used to save it back when me and Cindy started doing music. We would save it yeah. by the date, right? Okay. Or we we sure. record this is April first, whatever, right? And so then I started saving shit with just ridiculous titles, right? Yeah. Of whatever was going on that day, and I was creating this thing, and I was having hella issues with it. Have you ever done, and and maybe this has happened to you too, Tammy, everybody here that's created music, anyone watching the show, where you have an idea in your head and when you get to recording it, it doesn't, it doesn't, something isn't translating right from what is in your head to what you're actually putting down. Never has happened ever. Definitely not. (laughs) (laughs) Definitely not all the time. Definitely not most of the time. And I was having one of those moments and I fucking, and I stopped and I left 
And I came back. So yeah. to the wee hours of the morning, I'm putting this thing together. All day the following day, I'm putting everything together, like not sleeping, because I can't sleep. Because I'm like, no, no, I gotta go in there and finish this. I gotta add this part. And I gotta do this. And so when I'm getting ready to save it, I'm like, I'm gonna call this Black Yacht Rock. <laughs> and I was this close to putting Pascal's face on the cover. <laughs> Scandalous, but I didn't Scandalous. want him to walk to Mexico to beat the shit out. No, I, I was gonna say, I don't, I think that go over like Led Zeppelin, as they say, right? <laughs> I, I didn't want to... Why is Pascal not answering his phone anymore? <laughs> Pascal quits the show arbitrarily, yeah. nobody actually knows why. Wikipedia has three different theories, but so I, so when we were finally done with the song, Alex Miller masters it. We listen to the different mastered versions, he tells me to change some things we finally change some things and get it done conan i i not fucking with you i was up all night creating covers for this i haven't had this much fun in my life creating covers for something this is, remember this is all because he's really in the back of his mind pascal hates this shit. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. He's, he's honoring you in a way right because it's like this oh this will wind him up this is gonna be great yeah so it's it's an honor of sorts because if you listen to the song, there's nothing about it that is for the yacht, unless no, you're yacht. No, it's, it's, it, seems, it seems like it's just, you know, clever title. Right? It's just a funny title. Which I'm, I'm a fan of clever title. Tammy, yeah. this has to be enthralling Wait, for you, right? You like, you, you got to be loving this show. Show. I'm loving it. It's like 5 a.m. Thursday where you're at or something. And, and <laughs> Not that Loving every second of it. Yeah. <laughs> I'm Tucson. not on Mars. Tucson, who's, oh, you got to get Tucson in. She's off the screen. Tucson, who's on the screen now? Who y'all think it is? Is that Steve? This is Steve. <laughs> oh my God. Uh, I'm just glad that MT finally dropped the uh, brown paper bag test to get on the show. You know? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, you know, I noticed you got the Dr. Umar Johnson face on your. Uh... Oh, for sure. And then we never gonna beat those uh Jewish black conspiracy theories. <laughs> <laughs> we never beat those allegations now. You never know what you're gonna get when you fuck with Tucson and and apparently Jordan. Steve, thank you very much for for coming on. You are the creator of Anglo pessimism. That's correct. That is correct. I ain't seen one penny yet. Just I was gonna say you get points won't. on that. Yeah. <laughs> Nigga, you're the only. <laughs> I work you, got, you got paid an exposure, son. That's what happened. Yeah, you got paid an exposure. <laughs> nah, I'm just, I'm just, I'm just playing. I'm, a, I'm, I'm sure ignite you. <laughs> <laughs> you don't want your podcast to all up in the videos. Scandalous. I'm a, I'm a Leo too, though. So I just want to say happy birthday, man. Uh, I know it's a storm coming on the uh, West Coast, so be safe. You know, uh, you know, I'm just glad to be on the show. Appreciate it, Steve. Like all jokes aside, you are one of the main reasons why I lose my shit trying to keep a straight face. Yo, on I'm not gonna lie. Steve had sh sh shoot some of the best shots. Oh my for God. me and you in the show. We can't I'm like, keep a straight I know this face. Negro, the funniest thing that I saw Steve say is like, the only reason I watch the show is I like when y'all talk about them black elite motherfuckers. <laughs> <laughs> that's my favorite. That's my favorite part about the show, man. You know. <laughs> Well, oh, hey, you are you are an appreciated member of everything that we do, and you're one of the reasons why I don't sleep and do all this reading and try to find guests and keep doing this thing because it's that love that we get back. For me personally, I can't speak for everybody else on the show, but it's that love that we get back that makes you go, "Oh yeah, yeah, man, we got yo, listen, man, we got to keep some of our few black followers." <laughs> Because you don't see who's you don't know who's black that watches the show. It's not like you know. We we got we got a few we got a few. They be in the uh, Discord beefing all the time, but we got a few. <laughs> <laughs> Just like good leftists. Yeah, they. <laughs> I, you step in there on the wrong day, you catch a stray. Like, Golly, I, I don't fuck with you people. <laughs> Nah, Steve, much love and thank you for coming on. And thanks for being a loyal fan of the show, man. Thank you. Steve. All right, man. Y'all be easy. Take care. Thank you. Thank you so much.
Tucson here to hang around. Tammy, do you have to go? Because I know it's late where you are. Um, we got Charles Nelson Riley coming up. You're not going to win. <laughs> <laughs> I'm in no hurry right now. It's 4, 17 a.m. And I've got nowhere to be. So <laughs> there you go. Oh, yeah. damn. Focus okay. Right. Well, Tammy yeah. said, fuck it. I'm going to take that 12 o'clock in the morning ass whooping. Okay. <laughs> she, she's a real party dad. That's what she is. <laughs> That's that DJ, DJ lifestyle. Right. Yeah. <laughs> I usually play at five in the morning when I play. So it's I get have warmed to get up. up at three. Yeah. Oh, it's shit. Warmed it's Camilo. Hey. <laughs> Happy birthday, Jason. Gracias, hermano. <laughs> now, Camilo, up, man? now, here is very the, the most sunny time that it has been in Lima ever in, in August. Normally, it's only sunny from, from January to March, and then it's kind of cloudy, but this year it has been sunny <laughs> all year long, so it's kind of weird. <laughs> So the storm isn't affecting uh, you. No, the storm is is more on the north, on the northern coast. I, I'm kind of on the central coast, so. So for now. just me here in Mexico, I'm getting fucked with. <laughs> oh, <shit. laughs> it's a personal attack, really. <laughs> yeah. All I wanted was sunshine on my birthday, and uh, guy was like, "Man, fuck that." No, I, I, there is a curious story about Norman Finkelstein and Peru, which is that when I was um, going to uh, to like, there are a lot of uh, bootleg copies of films, and there is a bootleg copy of of uh, Norman Finkelstein documentary, uh, the American Radical. So it's weird because you see like. Uh, the Avengers and next is the is the picture of the rough fingers. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, that's that's what. Yeah, we gotta look. First of all, I've been wanting to get you on anyway because there's some stuff we got to talk about uh, in in Mexico and just uh, the Southern Hemisphere in general. There's a lot going on. A lot yeah. going on in Latin. A lot America. going on. So yeah. We got we got to talk about that, Conan. Well, you don't you don't need a man in a loud jacket to uh, out of that conversation. <laughs> so, uh, I'll go ahead and uh, see myself out. Um, Conan, yeah, you're, adult you're, prom. You're, oh, yes. Plug your I was record. Do my plugs. Yeah, adult yeah. prom split LP out. Uh, Neutronfriends.bandcamp.com. Uh, you know, we talk big game in the left about uh, supporting each other, but uh, unfortunately, we do still live in a society, and uh, we do still have bills to pay. So, yeah, if you want to pre-order that. Uh, LP, CD, digital download. It's always uh, appreciated. Uh, always great to be on the show, even if it's just like random guest spots like this, just to sort of uh, drop in behind enemy lines and wish happy birthday or whatever it is we're doing. Um, but yeah, I want to make sure there's room for everyone else. Um, Neutronfriends.bandcamp.com. Uh, Protonic Reversal. More or less weekly. I did three shows this week. I got Steel Pole Bathtub coming up on Sunday. So people into that weird rock music that's sort of my beat uh tammy uh i think you were wonderful and really enjoyed the conversation that i heard uh, oh, thank you and uh pascal it's been a long time man i know we should talk more often we should talk more often it's great to see you and uh Tassan, doing a great job ruthless with the producing ruthless thank you I, 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 that's what you gotta be you gotta be ruthless so. <laughs> uh camilo i don't know you but uh, i'll be uh <laughs> checking you out on on when I when I go off air here, so thanks everyone. Take care. Okay, thanks, Kobe. Thank Love you, you brother. So much. Thank you. I've been I've been blessed to know some good people in my life, and I will say that uh, Conan Neutron is one of the most wonderful and literal helpful people you will ever meet in uh, in the world, and definitely in music. If you ever need a hand in anything, he's always willing to help. So he's a he's a great friend. Uh, I mean, <laughs> What's up, gang? Oh shit! It's David Gris. <laughs> so much happy. At least he's not Jewish. <laughs> oh, God. H happy birthday, brother! How's it going? Pretty good. Uh, I got hit by a barrage of Jewish people. Oh, well, there you go. And now we're finally getting the ratio back to where it needs to be. We have Camilo <laughs> on the screen. We have, uh, you know. David on the screen, who is not Jewish, <laughs> unless you're gonna, you know, fucking Scooby Doo me and like, fucking <laughs> ah, that'd be a funny reveal later in life. 
<laughs> wait, wait, is college football started? I mean, it's getting ready to, man. The um, Everyone's getting pretty excited here. I'm feeling like the University of Texas is going to be a force. Oh, this motherfucker. The kids are here, though, which means Ikea is a zoo. I've just moved into a new place, so I'm like having to go to Ikea right now, and it's all a bunch of UT students with their mom and dad buying the shitty ass, shittiest furniture oh, that you can get. For. That's the great thing about Mexico, man. There's no Ikea here. So yeah. it's just the real deal. <laughs> is there Ikea in Peru? No. Okay. Yeah, see, when you have no Ikea, you, you there's something better than Ikea, and that is oh, yeah. <laughs> fucking Latin American furniture. That's some real shit. It reminds you of, it reminds you of your mama house in the 80s. Where's <laughs> I saw, you had, I saw you had a Vivek Chebra on your show recently. Yeah, we did. Oh, he was... He, he was, was mad as fuck. Yo, well, my, he was, him off. Kick, Vivek Chebra was kicking some ass. Dude, I mean, he's so good. He pissed everyone off. And I, I, I'm like, I would honestly just do a podcast with Vivek. Just get him on and just like get him to work everybody up in the audience. <laughs> he, he was on fire. Did you see that shit, Camilo? Vivek on Left Reckoning? No, I, I like so much has been happening here in, in Peru. I haven't uh, followed that much. Well, we forget the outside Peru. <laughs> <laughs> it's, 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 uh, it's been while, like the cops have, like, uh, yeah, it's, it's a lot of basically a lot of uh, every day, like cops are getting arrested because like they have been discovered to be part of a criminal organization so basically <laughs> all day cops are getting arrested by so yeah it's it's being strange well you don't need to watch then you don't need to watch vivek talking about white why white white leftists in the u.s are <laughs> annoying. got stuff going on in the streets um. yeah <laughs> camilo you <laughs> you see what's going on outside no man shut up there's Vivek's talking about white people again. <laughs> <laughs> Can't be worried about this foolishness you people are doing in Peru. Yeah, uh, Vivek is not a big fan of left internationalism at all, bro. Not at all. I've never seen Vivek Chibber smile. <laughs> you can get him to smile. You can get him to smile. You can't get him to smile for shit. I watched I watched a little bit of that show and he was making me uncomfortable. I wasn't even white. And I was like, God damn. <laughs> <laughs> Vivek was like, I was like, shit. Because you know Vivek and Adolf Reed are, are cool. Yeah. And uh that's another gentleman that is not good with grinning. <laughs> Because you know they work in academia, and academia is not friendly to people with their opinions. So they are they're like hardened by it. I very much understand how they get that way. Oh, that's a very good theory. That, can... That's what we'll blame it on. I got I got Adolf Reed a present actually. Oh, nice. I'm not going to say what it is. It was a baseball card, but I'm not going to say who it is. Is he a big baseball guy? Yeah. He's he a big is. baseball guy. He's a big baseball guy. He's a big guy. sports guy. He's bigger he than you would have thought. You know, you know what? You know how I say he doesn't smile, David? Because that Negro sends me emails. <laughs> Fuck with me. <laughs> I mean, he's a, okay, maybe he's not. Hey, I'm not getting that about Adolf. I mean, Adolf's probably one of the funniest you, people you ain't getting in the one world. Fuck with, hey, why ain't your quarterback shit is in the subject line? <laughs> <and he's> <laughs> <laughs> the, the best thing is when Adolf was doing a bunch of streams during quarantine, um, and he was just doing it in this dirty ass like basement. You know, there's just like stuff everywhere. But right behind him was like a you know like a lifting bench, a weightlifting bench. Yeah, so I just like to imagine that Adolf is just like you know pumping some iron in between streams and then jumping on and talking a lot of shit with a um, Newport hanging out his mouth. One of them motherfuckers was. <laughs> <laughs> Lift him weights with a cigarette. Oh man, I, I'm not looking forward to football season because I know I'm gonna get a bunch of Russell Wilson ain't shit. Uh, I mean, emails. he's not though. Sorry. Wow. Well, dude, I mean, I'm sorry. Like you got that, and you know, West Coast football seems like it's gonna be over for a generation. No, it's just gonna be played <laughs> in, in Ohio, Midwest. Yeah, <laughs> where it belongs. All the greats. Wait, am I on now? Oh. <laughs> He's back from his trip. Hello, everyone. Cuba. <laughs> the, 
in my back room, I released. Right? <laughs> <laughs> Cuba had his second wedding in oh. Asia. Nice. Oh, is that what you were doing in in, uh, in China? Yes, exactly. Well, uh, I mean, I found out about it um, two weeks before it was going to happen. I thought I was just going to meet the in-laws, but then it's like, <laughs> uh, there's also going to be a, just a little get together with some people. And I'm like, and first it was going to be 20 people. Then it was 120 people. <laughs> and then it's like, yeah, yeah, we're just going to do that. The second wedding now. Uh, you're going to be the only English speaker. Uh, wow. so, so, so just just roll with it, right? Like do a lot of nodding and smiling. Just smile all the time, no matter what. <laughs> also, it's going to be 35 degrees with 100% humidity. Um, and this is going to feel like the rest of your life. <laughs> what did you wear? Uh, this is Get ready for this, David, because you're about to get married soon. I know. And you may have a second yeah. wedding. <laughs> I don't know if I'm going to have a second wedding. I hope the same thing Kuba said. Kuba said the same shit like, ha, 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 ha. And oh, 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 oh. <laughs> yeah. I, thought, I thought I was just meeting the in-laws, right? Yeah, that's but all no, thought. no, you uh, <laughs> end up in a, uh, both a, a Ming and a Qing dynasty uh, <laughs> scholar's robes. And you oh, learn yeah. that there are four or five different types of uh, ways to bow. Um, Jesus, and you have to remember them all. Quit bowing like a white man, <laughs> dude. We're gonna have to explain. exactly, exactly. We're gonna have to explain that. That, that was an awfully Caucasian bow there, Kuma. <laughs> <laughs> um, we're gonna have to explain to you know my like white Texas family what's going on because we're doing a Persian ceremony. Um, because my, my fiance is Iranian, and uh, like part of that is like when you get up to the altar, right? In, in like in like Iranian custom, there's this thing called tarof. So, like, you will like offer like everything to somebody, right? Like, somebody you meet on the street would be like, Come over to my house, you know, I'll give you this. Or, like, when I go to her family, you know, her, you know, my, my, my fiance's family's house, oh, we have the most expensive bottle of wine that we've been saving for like 50 years. Do you want it? And you're supposed to say no three times. Uh, so at the altar, uh, when they ask my fiance if she wants to marry me, she's going to say no um, two times before she finally <laughs> says yes. Or maybe she'll say no three times and it'll get yeah, awkward. Which would be a really <laughs> uh, That sounds like a sitcom waiting to happen. <laughs> you, you, I'm, you glad they, I'm glad they told you beforehand because I would have been <laughs> fucked up if you didn't know. Will you marry me? No. Bitch, I paid all the... <laughs> Can you guys hear me? We, I can hear you now. Okay, okay, good. We're gonna have to say goodbye to some of you guys. We have people banging on the doors to get in. All right, thank you guys. Oh. Happy birthday, friend. Before I get purged, happy birthday. Thank you, Kuba. I got to talk to you anyway. <laughs> that that sounds ominous. Well, I just I we want to do a show about your trip to China. The um, is is this a secure channel? <laughs> <laughs> nope, nope, not at all. So yeah, I'll I'll talk to you when we're done. Peace, brother. Is that Josh Con Russell? Hey! Oh shit! Happy birthday! Everybody's Happy favorite birthday. organizing Happy guy. Birthday. The only the only person to ever take me on a hike. Did you know that? In real wow. Life. Yeah. All right. I'll Josh Con Russell is the only person that I've ever went on a hike with, and I didn't know what a hike was. The, uh, I thought it was I think something. You had, a, you had an idea what a hike was. Right? I thought it was something that white people did to, to get away from black people. Lived in the Josh Bay Tucker. Area. That doesn't mean it's not. I exactly, Josh, and I went to Albany High, and I stayed away from you people in hikes. Uh, well, there you go. There's a lot of black people in the Bay hike. It's the only place I know that black people hike, actually. <laughs> you turned me into one of the hikers. Now I got to get some North Face shit. Always recruiting. How you doing? It's been way too long. It's been, you know what? I thought about you yesterday because I was in Walmart 
and there was a woman that was very lost because there's there's a very small amount of carts in Walmart and she didn't know how to get one. She was a uh, Canadian. So I was trying to explain to her how to get a cart. We ran each other again. And I was like, oh, do you live here? She goes, no, I'm here for a spiritual retreat. And I was like, really? And she was talking about doing ayahuasca. At Walmart? <laughs> that would be a nightmare. Ayahuasca is in Peru. Generally, people go to to the Amazon to do ayahuasca. They don't go to Walmart. <laughs> no. <laughs> I, I just got back from Iquitos two weeks ago. Cool. Yeah, I, I have been in Iquitos. Although mm -hmm. my family, like part of my family, is from the Amazon, but from other part that doesn't have an an airport, so I haven't go there. Yeah, that there's a there's. I, I didn't know they do that here, but I guess there's all these retreats here for spiritual healing. And uh, the woman just stopped. She was telling me about all the trips she was on. There was another thing she had done. What else? There's ayahuasca and there's something else you do that's like super out there. Um, wachuma or mushrooms. Oh, maybe that's what she said. It's just mushrooms or is it like special mushrooms? I mean, they're pretty special. <laughs> <laughs> like there's like mushrooms when you're at Tammy's DJ gig and then there's, there's <laughs> yeah, yeah no I mean they're different but also the context is different but okay. but yeah I just yeah Camilo I bring down um social movement leaders and organizers to do like trauma healing down in Peru like four times a year cool wow yeah. no yeah the 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 Amazon sadly is, is is one of the areas that has been badly hit for particularly because of COVID-19 like a lot has 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 happened or it was very difficult to to do any kind of uh, of, of social distancing of sanitizing because it, it, it uh, part of Iquitos basically all year long it's uh, uh, like it's called like the beneath of the Amazon because like uh, the the rain goes so high that it's uh, yeah it's basically like people living literally on, on the on the river so it's it's kind of nice aesthetically but complex to to live on the day by day mm -hmm. yeah everybody that i know down there got covid everybody. really yeah i mean most people i know i guess up here got covid too but it was different different down there. yeah yeah the the health sector also is is much uh is much limited than here because here at least there is a, a bit of, of a much larger private sector which is kind of um it's uh, complicated and you know like uh, bureaucratic also but uh but there is much less uh, a lot of the people that want to to study also leave uh the city so a lot of in latin america in general a lot is concentrated in, in the capital city in which in peru is lima so that also complicates things because like uh, a lot of people particular for um oncological treatments for example travel from all over peru to, to lima and, and that's kind of complicated because it's very limited the treatments that people have in in, in the region so that's also a kind of source of, of tension in general in in Latin America. Jeez. So when you go deep into the, to Peru, Josh, are you going somewhere where it's like scary cannibal holocaust deep in the Amazon, or is it just kind of there's still electricity and stuff like that? Uh, I mean, there's a generator. It's I mean, it's a community that is like you fly into Iquitos, which um, is what Camilo was talking about. That it's, it's the largest city in the world that cannot be accessed by road um wow and then you take like a motorbike deep into the jungle and then a boat and then a, a hike and then you're at a clearing and you know there's a generator there's a now there's starlink um starlink is, 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 yeah, wild. Totally wild. i was at a facebook conference years ago and that was part of their goal that uh, Elon Musk has taken over, that they wanted to have internet in places that there was no, like even electricity at, so. Mm -hmm. Yeah. They're winning. Yeah. I didn't even say hi to Pascal. We haven't gotten to meet Pascal, but I'm, I've known Jason for a while and been on the show a couple of times. I've, I've heard about your, your Jason your conversations like that, Joshua. You know, I would look forward for us being on an episode at the same time again in the future. That would be 
That yeah, let's do it. We were trying to get Josh on a while ago, and he was he uh, he did that thing where he like flinged his hair, and he was like, "I'm too busy." <laughs> well, I did take a break from podcasts. I, I I'm kind of still on it, but this is different because it's your birthday. Well, I look, brother. I appreciate that. <laughs> High five. High five. I'm right, gonna be if you're still in the bay, I'll be in the bay next week. What? If you're still in the bay, I'll be in the bay next week. Oh, well, that was what I was gonna ask when you were coming up because I got you a present, but you have to come to the bay to get it. But you have to come to the bay on uh October 7th. <laughs> okay. I, if, I, if, I, if, if, well, if you come up, I'll um I'll get you a, a, a ticket to take you. We'll go see bad religion. Oh, that sounds like hella fun. Okay. Yeah. Done deal. Cool. Done deal. But I will be up next week if you're around. Yep. I'm oh actually. Okay. I'll we'll, I'll I'll follow up. I think I'm actually leaving, but I'll send you a text message and I'll see if you're around. Beautiful. So good to see you all. Hi Tammy. We haven't met either. But hi and Hello. bye. Hi and bye. <laughs> Peace, Josh. Nice to meet you. Thank you, Josh. Thank you for Tucson. I didn't, I forgot. Hey, you're I, didn't blank. I didn't know that you were here or not. That's okay. <laughs> Go, it's good to see you. Yeah, thanks well, for the invitation. All thank right. you, Camilo. Thank you so much, brother. Really, we will talk soon. Yeah. Yes, Bye. definitely. Thank, thank you, Camilo. You thank you. Love you, Josh. Who's, who's next on Murderer's Road, Tucson? Let's see. Let's <gasps> Ah, if it isn't my sweet brother Noomsi. Bert, what's up, dude? What is that? What does it say? Happy 80th birthday to the king of Hinge. <laughs> what's up, bro? Happy birthday, man. Birthday, Tammy. what's going on, bro? Hey, this is Bert, hey, Bert yeah. Cooper. Oh, He's man. a New York Times columnist. Uh, Atlantic columnist. He is. I know, you know who he is. <laughs> oh, she knows. Yep. The most decorated light skinned man under 40. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Oh, man. I making all, the, making all the black petite bourgeois quiver. Oh, look. man. Look. I'm trying. I'm trying to do that. I also like man. to get that word just in a popular circulation. I should use that in the Atlantic. Like I'm just <laughs> writing my bio, just coming for the petite bourgeoisie. Bert. I just tell you, man, you know, right? I'm getting. I look at my time on uh, Facebook, and I'm looking at all of my friends rushing off to Martha's Vineyard for the summer Oak Bluffs getaway, and I'm like, oh my gosh, oh, this is really interesting. <laughs> you know, it's um, yeah, you would love, you'd love the imagery, uh, Bertrand. I, yeah, I can imagine it would give you a whole incentive for a whole literary you know just uh idea Bert, Bert, can you imagine Bert walking to martha's vineyard they would get so mad at him is that that negro that wrote the piece in the atlantic <laughs> <laughs> Show you know, i can never get out of the mindset that like no one's gonna read this shit <laughs> oh <laughs> nigga <laughs> even when it's in the atlantic like i'm just not expecting it i i didn't know that people were gonna pick up on it i mean listen bro let me make this clear to go from Tani Huse Coates to you at the Atlantic, brother, that's a big that's a big transition in the positive, in a positive direction, because they weren't having no class analysis of black life with Tani Huse Coates, man. He's a race, you know, you know, he's about race reductionism and the black united front of like, we're all in this together against the man in our Afro pessimistic days. You know, he's one of those Negroes. So when you coming in and you're talking about like, yeah, I got out yo, know, these niggas are part of the problem. Yeah, <laughs> they you know that that discourse, I don't think you understand how totally outside the box that discourse is in American journalism. I mean, even in, in American literary circles. I mean, you know, besides you know, E. Franklin Frazier, Adolph Reed, and a few other, maybe some aspects of Gerald Horn. There are very few people who will expose the way internal class stratification 
amongst black people leads to black oppression. And you do it so eloquently, man. So uh, I, I salute you, brother. Didn't know you were getting that, huh? I didn't know. I appreciate it. I mean, you got to be light skinned. They let you in through the front door. No. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but no, I feel like if Adolf Reed was like 30 years younger, he would have taken my spot. But no, I. it's funny that you mentioned that lineage with the Atlantic because, um, you know, I didn't grow up around like a lot of political discourse. And then the Atlantic really put its weight behind um you know, Tony Easy Coates, and there was just kind of this wave where, like, now there were all these long form essays in places like the Atlantic featuring black writers. And then, with each, you know, um, terrible killing of a black person, it would be like a new team of writers. And so I was watching all of that. And so I know this lineage of the Atlantic where they've been focused on black issues, quote unquote, for a while. But I, I did feel pretty cool get my piece in there and it did feel like man um i i read this magazine for years without seeing any open discussion of um class hostilities or differences between black people and now i was getting to put that in there um yeah i was really happy to do that uh well i'm glad you were happy to do that but now all these black people are like this we're coming for you nigga <laughs> Oh, speaking of people Happy dropping birthday. their bombs, it's Catherine Lou. Coming for you. Coming for you. Oh, wow. Coming for you. Catherine Lou. Catherine Lou. Hey. Didn't know that was happening. In a room full of black people. Happy birthday. I'm used to it. <laughs> I don't know. Stop, stop y'all's Asian hate. That's what I'm here to say. Catherine. <laughs> <laughs> Catherine, they they you know the neighbors get mad with Catherine be having parties because she'll be inviting me and Cedric Johnson and shit. And the neighbors is like, I don't know what she. Can do. <laughs> no, we're we'll doing a dance party next. Happy African birthday! Happy birthday, Jason! Thank you so much. I was just talking to you the other day about trying to see you and your husband in real life. Yep, yep, we'll do it. Sorry. I don't know if I told you this while what? I was there. And maybe you had left already, but I want to say this on air for everyone to know about how I feel about you and your family. <laughs> I appreciate the mothering that you do for someone that is so far away from his own mother. Aww. And, you know, when you stay with Kath, well, I, I can't speak for the rest of you niggas. When I stay with <laughs> never got an advice. <laughs> with Catherine. I, He's just a, dropping a, that in bomb. I am. It's my birthday. And I'm black. <laughs> And I'm just from the hood. Okay. So okay. There's Go that on. as well. Uh, they're like they. It just reminds me of home. And the last time I was there, yeah. And the last time I was there, Aww. it was hard for me to leave because I didn't know you had that really nice toilet. <laughs> and that toilet. <laughs> was a game changer it did 12 things at the same time i don't know if you know what toilet i'm talking about but you got to have a real fancy friend or be in a hotel in a foreign country to have a toilet like this that's what we it's not that expensive but um we got one because we stayed at a hotel in beijing are we really going to talk about this on your birthday? I okay, just want everyone to know, if you see me say on air that I'm going to Catherine Lou's house, just know I'm not coming back for a couple of days. <laughs> they feed you well. And, you know, the accommodations are very, very comfortable. You, it's they, very Asian. It's very Asian to like that. To, you know what? Let, long live Blasians. <laughs> Jason's a big fan of them. I know. I know. I know. Listen, um, listen, we live in California, so the mixing is happening. Uh, we have our wages, we have our blazes, we're taking over, we're coming for you and your DNA. Okay? <laughs> There's just more of us than there are of you in the world. And uh Blasian is the way. I mean Wasian, okay, but Blasian <laughs> I see that y'all don't get enough Asians on here <laughs> to speak the truth to you homies. Bert, I'm telling you, if we go to Catherine Lou house, you'd be like, damn, man, why can't you be my mom? <laughs> it's not a stiff competition. I'm sure Catherine's like a great mom, but it's not. she is. I've, you know, I've, I've met her son. 
They've they've actually been in my house. They've Wonderful been, family. He knows, he knows us all. Yeah. So no. um, oh wait, wait, but can I? Are we are we just like talking for your birthday? We can just say anything, right? You can. So Leo has this. My son has this total hatred of the white man Asian woman couple, which <laughs> obviously is Oedipal because that's his that's his yes. parents, right? But um, he just feels like it is the most um, offensive to Asian men. You know, he's a bit of an Asian man meninist, right? <laughs> so, like, he's got that ki- Asian man energy, and he um, he is always celebrating when he sees like an Asian man with a white woman because he feels like that's the right combination, the Asian Chad. <laughs> very sensitive to the emasculation of Asian men. Don't don't ask why. But there's like also what he really celebrates is the Blasian combination that is the Asian man black woman. Like he feels like that's the right combination. He needs to move to the Bay Area then, because he could do that all day long. Can he? But you know what? He's in China, so he doesn't have to. Oh, here's the really scary thing: is that in China there are a lot of white guys who go there to teach English. And they end up marrying Asian Chinese women. They're and you know he's like white. He's Asian, so he's got he's you know got some credibility. But he's like terrified and hating them because he finds that it's just like colonialism, neo colonial, whatever. It's like it's crazy. He's you know got a crazy bit going on about that. Who knows? But, but long live Blasians, Be that as it may, may Blasians take over the world. Jason's doing a good job of working on that. Believe I know, I know. May your progeny go forth and prosper. Do you know my favorite kind of Blasian is Jam Asians. What is Jam that? Asians? Is that Jamaican? Jam Asians, Asians, Jamaican Chinese. Jam Asians, best best cuisine, best looking people. The Jam Asians. Interesting. Lord of mercy. Jam Asians. Wow. Yeah. Oh, sorry. We, have, we don't have the Haitians. We don't have a lot of Haitians. <laughs> the Haitian Asians. No, we don't have a lot of that. Yeah, we don't. Yeah. But you know what's really interesting about you. your son's feelings? If yes. you if you look at like dating reports, yes. Well, apparently there's some basis to that that a lot of women that they really give a lot of hate to Asian men. And I think that's because of the way in which Asian men have been depicted in popular culture and it, to some extent. Okay, but that, that's some of it, but some of it is just like Asian culture is really sexist, right? The, con, the dad is really Confucianism. Yeah. It's really bad for women. That's really the case for me. So you thought, I could escape this by dating a white guy. Mm. Yeah, that's true. I mean, the thing is, though, I've, I mean, I grew up with, like, one of my icons of, like, the coolest example of masculinity was Bruce Lee. Bruce Lee was like when I was a German. Kid, Bruce Lee was like right. one of because right. first of all Bruce Lee wasn't also good at fighting. He was very intelligent. He was very articulate. He was like smart. He was into philosophy and whatnot. So he was like for a lot of black kids who were my age, he was one of our icons. Right. So I didn't get this notion of like Asian guys were weak and soft until like I got into my college years or I was in law school. Mm. I was seeing these images. I was like, this really is a contradiction of the iconography that I was seeing mm. when I was a kid. Mm. Yeah. Um, all I heard was Pascal said Asian guys are weak and soft. So <laughs> <laughs> and that's what's going on Twitter. That's all that's all that meant. <laughs> We're just, oh my God. Okay. This is revolution, yeah. says Asian men, small penis. Like, no, no, it was never said. It was never said. I don't know. Do your thing, Toussaint. Where are you? Are you doing it from off the screen? Do your thing. Do whatever you have to do. Welcome, my good friend, Ben Burgess. <laughs> Dr. Dr. Ben, how are you? I am very good. How are you? Are you in LA? I am. Wonderful. How's it working out for you? You like it out there? Hillary's yeah. coming for you know what? Hillary's coming for us. Hillary, not Hillary Clinton. Hurricane Both. Hillary. 
Oh, oh hurricane. Like hurricane. Oh, okay. Yeah. I had the same thought, Pascal. I was like, what the fuck is Hillary doing? <laughs> <laughs> aren't you um no wait, Ben, aren't you stocking up on um dried foods and uh <laughs> batteries? Oh, uh, is the question, should I or <laughs> or have I? <laughs> You what know, category? I feel like the, the boy, it, the people have cried wolf too much. I just can't understand. Like, should we be worried or what? Yeah, I don't know. I mean, I lived in Miami for many years, and uh, and it was uh, always, and I got like really jaded to this there. So, uh, it, Jason, you're in the line of fire too. Yeah, we're just no like, the storm. So my daughter has been following the storm. Speaking of yeah. Malaysians, I got a very wonderful phone call this morning from. The most adorable uh, Blasian, whose birthday is actually next week. She'll be twenty-five on the twenty-fifth. Um, and are she... all of your children Blasians? Yeah. Yes, all of them. Yeah. Of a specific ethnic type of Blasian. Yeah. He won't make any others. <laughs> they are not only Blasian; they are yes. all half Filipino and half black. He wanted really good boxers. He said he would have loved them. Oh, 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 that's hilarious. Okay. Oh, so they're um, flat Filipino, flat Filipino. My daughters, um, my daughters and sons say black apino. Black apino. Black apino. Wow. That's what they say. Wow. Well, you know what? I like a man with focus. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Okay. Okay. So what did your Blasian's daughter say? My daughter told me that she said the storm is going to hit Ensenada hard, but it looks like it's not going to hit the area that I'm in hard. Really? And I was asking my neighbor next door who, who Ben knows, I was asking Scotty if he was boarding up his windows. Yeah. Because Scotty was like, I'm preparing for the storm. I was like, oh, should you boarding up your windows? And he laughed at me. And he goes, no, I'm just going to get like fuel for the generator. So if you need power, you know, I can throw you a line. So, no, it shouldn't be that bad. But sadly, people have like canceled their their uh, trips down here. And uh, so mm -hmm. tourism, being that we just had this huge week, is going to hurt mm -hmm. a little bit. But mm -hmm. It is what it is. I got a pop out for a little bit to let one of your other adoring fans wish you a happy birthday, but I'll probably be back in like 15 minutes. Bert, I love you like a play cousin. And you take care. <laughs> Thank you, man. Enjoy all the birthday wishes. I'll see you in a bit. That's, that, is, that is my little brother, by the way. Bert no Cooper. way! Bert Cooper no way. is like my little play brother. Oh, wait, you're play brother. Okay. Yeah, no, my, my real little brother is a black man that lives in... I'm going to go on the phone. <laughs> Um, Jason, I have to um, um, and at some point talk to you about um, the idol, and maybe I want to come on here and stream with you. Okay. But you know that HBO series. So. I haven't seen anything. Yeah. Okay. okay. Let's do it. Yeah, but I'm gonna I'm gonna probably have to go now too. And I just wanted to wish you a happy birthday. I hope this is really fun. Ben, really good to see you. Pascal, good to see you. And we'll see each other all soon, I hope, in real life. Or if not, I'll, I'll be I'll you. be crossing the border next week. You're finally uh, you're finally back from your European and uh, I know. I'm finally back. Show, finally yeah. back. Yeah, yeah. And uh, you know what? It was hard. It was a hard, hard landing. <laughs> hard. hard. <laughs> well, thank you so much, Catherine. All right. Do your thing, Tucson. Do your thing, Tucson. Keep bye. doing your thing, Tucson. I know bye. you're not on screen right now. Oh, Can bye. this now? Okay. Bye, babe. Bye, everyone. Bye-bye. Tucson, who's with us now, since you're being so quiet? Tucson. Did she mute herself? She bailed. You got somebody on screen. Who's on screen? Andy. Oh, me? That's me? Oh, happy Andy. birthday, Jason. Andy. Yo, what's up? What's up? What's up? Yo, this, by the way, this has been the most eugenicist, racist thing, fucking Madison Grant podcast I've ever heard, ever. I hear, like, I jump in, I hear Jamaican, I hear everything that is completely antithetical to the left. See, it's everything possible. See, I've got to say, like, this seems pretty mild to me because, uh, you know, I was, I was Jason's next door neighbor for six months. So, like, I've, I've heard. 
I've heard distinctions about okay, if you know, if your dad is like an eighth black, <laughs> like, you know, like this is like there were there were like all but charts. We're doing fucking one drop rules with the leftist Nick Cannon, I, aka the leftist <laughs> fucking Edison Pack, leftist Edison Pack, say happy birthday, saying uh, you know what, I'm here with all the Asians. Yo, but I did run into a Haitian and uh, a Haitian and Japanese chick in a strip club, like probably like almost a decade ago. Oh my goodness! Insane. Insane. What does she look like? She sounds like a wonderful combination it, of things. It, insane. Like to this day, I'm just like, <laughs> look at Ben's yeah. face. Ben was like, trying to like, oh shit, it's like ghetto anime. <laughs> <laughs> it's a uh, anime with Guido. <laughs> And Pascal just quiet, just sit back going, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's anime with uh, this the lead. It's uh, <laughs> I, hate I, hate I hate you, Andy. <laughs> For those that don't know, Andy is a person that watches the show that uh, me, Andy, Tucson, Cuba, Ben was with us. Yep. We all went with the, the sublation launch party, and I don't think me and Ben were invited to this current sublation party. No, for right. whatever reason. Yeah. Too much race, I think. Right? Yeah, Doug. Uh, <laughs> we we all after the sublation party, uh, fucking Hannah Feldman, and yeah. we all went out to get food with Anders Lee. Yeah. Anders Lee didn't know where we were supposed to go. We went to some other place. We walked all over fucking New York. And then he left. And then he, <laughs> he's like, oh, my girlfriend's going. And he left. And then they left me to eat in New York with all the rats. Rats was big as shit. And I screamed all night. <laughs> I, I must have missed that part somehow. <laughs> you left early. You left yeah, early. Yeah. You and Cuba left early. Okay. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah you, left you, you, I don't you and Cuba the rats are screaming. I, I, I remember <laughs> some, like sitting at a table eating some French fries, but I mean, like that's the, you know, that's that's much less Lovecraftian than what you're. Uh, you're <laughs> <thinking about. laughs> Me the and rats. Ben stole Jason's fries. Yeah, that <laughs> was... <laughs> because it took us like an hour and a half to get food, it, and we had like the most New York experience in the fucking bodega. But Andy was with us for that that journey. Andy also was at the New York live show. I don't know if you remember this, Ben. Uh, and he had no table, and I had to negotiate Andy sitting at a table with white people. Yeah, I sat with random white people. Jason is my facilitator. He's like my um, intermediary between me and white people. <laughs> I, grabbed a, I found a table of white people. Is anyone sitting here? I have a black friend. He is a, he's very non-threatening. <laughs> He's got he's a job clean. and everything. He's clean. <laughs> he reads. Uh, he reads leftist leftist text. You know what I'm saying? And he had a do rag and a toothpick hanging out. <laughs> I was looking like bro man and shit. <laughs> but yeah, that's 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 Andy, and that's Andy. Andy gets the VIP treatment at any live show because. Oh, thank you. I appreciate it. He's fucking Andy, dude. He when you can hang out with us to the wee hours of the morning and deal with me jumping all over tables because rats as big as small children are running around. Yeah, Ghetto it's talking south of the Ninja Turtles. A couple of slanders and whatnot. Ghetto ass rats. One rat had a nice ass fade and fucked up ass New York rats. <laughs> <laughs> One rat had a fucking freeform locks. <laughs> <laughs> Rats was talking shit because motherfuckers didn't have fresh J's on. <laughs> you niggas must be podcasters. <laughs> yo, Jason, you know when I um I was watching They Call Him Tyrone, and for some reason I felt like yo, you dubbed like you dubbed the whole film. I felt like your voice was too hot. <laughs> I was like, yo, this whole shit sound like Jason. <laughs> I tried to watch that movie, man, and I, and I couldn't do it. What? That's a, that's, I don't know. I, forgot. I mean, that was, that was that was that. Is, is any of the white people on screen seeing they, they clone Tyrone? Uh, Keeper, Keeper Sutherland. 
What you said, Ben? <laughs> ben, have you seen they clone Tyrone? What do you think? <laughs> Tammy, is is they clone Tyrone on Australian Netflix? I don't know. I cancelled my net Netflix subscription, so don't know. Is it because I they didn't have enough black movies? Tammy. Or what was that? Is it because they didn't have enough black movies? <laughs> uh, no, it's just I just they're just rubbish. That's fair. <laughs> That's fair. I don't know what Australian Netflix looks like, but. They clone oh, Tyrone is I want I want all you people to see it and tell me if I'm being wrong by not liking it. You people now we're on you people. Look at this here. Yeah. Yeah. I'm one of the good ones. I don't know what the fuck is wrong with you. One of the good ones. <laughs> Goddamn original. We have more guests. Uh, all right, dude. So, so I'm gonna check out. I have a four-year-old running around at these. Oh my guys. goodness. Andy, thank you so much for hanging out, brother. Yeah, I like y'all, man. Be blessed. Happy birthday. Thank you. Look forward Bye-bye. to seeing you. See ya. God, dude, that, that was one of the most fun times I had walking and talking shit with Ben and Cuba all over New York. But then again, I got to talk shit with Ben a lot. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but shit talking in real life is so much more fun. <sighs> oh, hey! shit! Oh my goodness. You thought I didn't know your birthday was today? Thought you were going to sneak that past me? I send this Absolutely. person on the screen right now so many inappropriate white people memes. <laughs> like I spend most of my day sending memes to you and Bert Cooper. And then I get them back in return. And that is our, that's the nature of our relationship is offensive videos. <laughs> You're just such a charmer, Jason. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, Tucson wanted to bring on like my real friends. I'm glad that. that I'm here. Well, I'm glad that you're here. Thank you so much for, for taking the time to talk to me. I think I of sent course. you something offensive this morning, did I? Or was it late last night? I don't night? remember. Maybe. We're, we're, we we have just a time difference that times we, we end up with each other a little bit. But I, w- I woke up the other day. Sometimes it's so funny. Every morning I'll wake up. I get up pretty early for work. And Jason is somehow already up. And yeah, I, it'll sleep. just be a stream of just the most insane shit you've ever seen. And then I love to send Jason videos that I think are very funny when I'm stoned and he does not. (laughs) I need to let, I think it is my, my public duty at this point Mm -hmm. to let everybody know about a wonderful up and coming recording artist who is Jason's favorite karaoke artist. Uh, his name is Just Tatum, and oh, I, the send Jason okay. his songs. <laughs> I send Jason his songs like four times a week, and every time Jason won't let the fact go because we can't figure out if it's a bit or not. I just want to know if it's a bit, man. I just got to know the <laughs> truth. Like, is this a bit? I feel like everything is a bit, and there's nothing like organically original. That's my beef, Tammy, with music in general. I feel like everybody <laughs> is coming up on doing some sort of a bit. Cause that's like the only way you can come up. Like nothing is like real anymore. And whenever I see stuff like that, I was like, ah, are you really serious? Or is this a bit? So I can't just have fun. And maybe that's from not doing drugs. Like that's the delicate like bit. I just want to point out. <laughs> you are the most Leo person I have ever met. Wait, wait, is that what? a good thing? That was such a, it's a, it's a good thing. I'm just saying you're you are Leo. You I mean you're a podcaster, so that was already a, a strike in the Leo column. You're I have a podcast. lot of Leo placements. I have a lot of Leo placements in my chart. Why do you think I got into podcasting and stand up comedy? <laughs> and I think you're one. fucking hilarious, by the way. 
for those that don't know. Thank and you're not even doing stand-up anymore, right? That. Did you, did you stop no, doing stand-up? No, I'm not right now. You know what? You can do stand-up, but nothing mm -hmm. will ever beat the high of the laziest joke you've ever heard making your 40-year-old coworker like bend over and slap his knee. <laughs> I love an easy laugh. And I just I do that a couple times a day at the office. Uh -huh. and that's enough. It itches that same place that stand-up did. I think the world is missing out. And I mean that sincerely as a fan of, of comedy. Um, ben, really ben got to come enough. with me to see stand-up comedy. Right? I, I did, yes. I uh, uh, saw Chris Riggins, uh, who has performed at much larger venues. Uh, <laughs> but... Uh, <laughs> But we saw him do a show for like 15 people at a barbershop. Mm -hmm. um, nice. And uh, and yeah, it was, uh, was a lot of fun. Got uh, went, to, uh, went to the comedy, uh, store. comedy store after, hung out in the, the back the room. room. And, uh, mm. um, you know, Jordan was like rolling cigarettes for celebrities and shit. So yeah, that was a good time. We have some yeah. fun. We have some fun. Yeah. Yeah. We're now in good. Hanging out with Jason ain't too bad. No, no, it's uh, it's not. It's not. There's there's going to be like the occasional, you know, like you're going to get the occasional lecture on like race science, you know, about the, you know, what the what the different combinations of parents, you know, make the children, you know, so that's, you know, you look at that. <laughs> uh, but, uh, I may try to get in a fight. Uh, you know, every now and again. Sure. Yeah. Um, that's uh, which is uh, is always fun to see. Right. Because I. Like, <laughs> Know, normally like 99 percent of the time you know jason's like the calmest man in the world you know be like you know oh okay hey guys right you know then like every now and again uh something hits him just the right way and you know and it's uh and i just think okay you know we all get through this and uh nobody uh nobody gets hit nobody goes to jail it's gonna be a great story jason we uh just have to cross <laughs> the border <laughs> <laughs> yeah i uh, you know, I, I did think we were going to get, like, spend 13 hours at the Canadian Border Patrol Station and, you know, get, you know, body cavity searches and stuff. But the important thing is that didn't happen. Didn't happen. And it didn't happen. And now it's really funny. <laughs> <laughs> and that's why you hang out with me. Speaking of people that we hang out with, here's another person that me and Ben know in real life, Wild Bill Cody. Happy birthday, Jason. So those boxing questions I was asking you, Bill? Yeah, Bert what was Cooper, it about? Bert Cooper was asking those questions. That was just oh, on really? earlier. Yeah, because he fights. Really? I didn't yeah. know that. Yeah, he trains well, in Muay Thai. Mm -hmm. I, I don't know if I had the right answer or not, but... Uh, he appreciated you know. all your answers. So for those that don't know, this gentleman on the screen that looks like, you know, a, a, just a happy older gentleman is not, first of all. Uh, <laughs> and... <laughs> And, <laughs> and whenever I think I've done some cool things in my life, I talk to Bill Cody and I go, well, maybe I haven't done enough. <laughs> Bill made an award-winning documentary. Bill uh, trained under celebrity boxers and trainers. Bill worked in the film industry, the music industry, and in politics. And now what is Bill doing? <laughs> I'm in Athens, <laughs> Georgia. I'm writing a book. I'm doing a, actually doing a music video for Pylon Reenactment, which is a Pylon uh, offshoot band tomorrow. And um, I'm going to try and make a documentary in Paraguay, which earlier you had people talking about dance music in South America. So I was interested in that. So... Yeah, so Bill, yeah, Bill went to Paraguay so he could make a movie about it. He didn't even go there to make a movie about it. He went there, and then now he's going to make a movie about it. That's my, that's my, uh, that's that's what I'm planning to do anyway. But uh, hey, uh, I've been listening to the whole conversation, and I, I wanted to interject with uh, what I used to call a Japanese toilet is now considered a smart toilet. They're about the same <laughs> price as a regular toilet, and everybody should get one. It is life changing. Um, so. Ben, ben didn't take shit at, ja at Captain Lou's house. Dude, everybody. <laughs> you know what? <laughs> How okay, did you so pass up that opportunity? In Los Angeles, I was going in like fairly poor 
houses. Not mm-hmm. you know, four days, like get a special toilet. I, I just and, I, and everybody, I all, all, the, all my bad. constituents had them, and I'm like, what the heck? So it, and they're I, amazing. I, they're, when I got it, here, yeah. I found out they're not they're not much more than a regular toilet. So I uh, I built an apartment next door, and I put my old toilet in there, and I got a smart toilet, and everyone should. So, well. Um, I probably do uh, do need to get going uh, soon so I can uh, somebody let other people come in and I can order a new toilet, you know, apparently. <laughs> come on. Uh, but, uh, yeah, happy birthday, Jason. I'm, I'm really, uh, I, you know, I almost missed this because a, a white woman told me a lie last night about the, uh, about the, the start time, but, uh, uh, but I'm glad uh, I'm glad I didn't. Um, hope, uh, yeah. Hope you're doing something fun for the rest of the day, and I will see you very soon, brother. I will see you yeah. soon too. Thank you, Ben. <laughs> Peace out. Me and Ben and Jordan and Matt Chrisman are going to be doing some live in studio uh, movie commentating on his show on August 28th. So set your calendars that it's going to be a very good time. So which I'm movie sure. are you going to watch? Creep Show. Okay. Uh, I mean, I'm sorry, it's not fucking you know Schindler's List. Jesus Christ! Oh no, no, I, <laughs> I I'm totally into B movies. I mean, I think you should uh, watch as many B movies as possible. Bill Cody, don't fucking tempt me with a good time because <laughs> I know that you know all the actors and shit that I love so much in these B movies, and I have been watching. So I've been watching all these Charles. First of all, Tammy knows. I've been watching way too many Australian B movies. Mm-hmm. And so I pivoted to Charles Bronson. And so after Charles Bronson, where else can you go from there? Chuck Norris. So I went to sleep last night watching a <laughs> Chuck Norris movie called um, Code of Silence. And Chuck oh. Norris, Toussaint, to your dismay, Toussaint, he was in the movie with a kerchief on. He was going through his kerchief phase. So you can call this my Chuck Norris phase, Tucson. Even though I'm not wearing one today. It wasn't outfit appropriate. Oh, shit! How'd you guys get my best friend? Is my mic on? Yes. So I uh, logged on. Wasn't sure if I was on the right thing. Then I heard about cavity searches and... Japanese toilets and <laughs> white people lying, and I figured I was in the right place. <laughs> For those that don't know, this is a recurring guest on this show. He's been on other shows as well after he was on this show. Is Coach Will. Will and Somebody. I went, went to high school together. He is uh, one of the coaches at Oakland High. and he's You've been there for, what, 15 years now? <laughs> uh, this is the beginning of 18. Jesus Christ. Yes. So Will has been coaching basketball while we were in school, he actually started coaching at the junior high, which was at the time up the street from our high school. And Will has players in the NBA. He definitely has a lot of kids contributing positively to society. And yeah. he, he tells the best stories about uh, sports and, and uh, the future of sports. A lot of my kind of vision of what the future of sports is which is not utopian whatsoever <laughs> a lot of our our conversations and uh yeah dude how long have we known each other 30 some years 92 yeah 92 we met yeah, so Jesus Christ. will nah. will was there when when the kids were born that's how that's how close <laughs> will and i are well let me let me tell you how old i am so uh we won the state championship this year and all those guys, like, uh, I'm actually right now at Dame Lillard's camp with, like, was it 20 of the top college and high school players? And I got, like, a 10-minute window. <laughs> but um, when we won the state championship, Dame and them, which was, what, 2008? Mm-hmm. I brought the team T-shirt that we had from that year. Mm-hmm. And then the moment we won, I put it on and put it on. Mm-hmm. Kind of tribute for them. But... <laughs> That shirt was older than two thirds of our team. Jesus Christ! <laughs> <laughs> Are we that fucking old, Will? 
Iya. Yeah. <laughs> 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 no, like so the guy running the drills for this camp I'm at kept mm. bunching me in with the young coaches because there's like some older guys and NBA assistants and some of the younger coaches. And I had to pull them aside. I was like, bro, you know, I'm 47, right? <laughs> <laughs> but you can't let me run. So you just turned 46. I just turned 46. Yeah. Where you? yeah Cause you're, you're younger. That's right. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So it's, it was, it was funny. It's like, bro, stop having me chase the rebounds. Dude. Like let the young guys do that. Oh my God. I'm going to be up in the Bay next week. If you're around me and Jail are going to hang out. Yeah, I, I had hit her uh, about a week and a half or so ago about going to get food. So, yeah, you know, because I, I I I bug her every time she has an overdraft fee. <laughs> I told you, that, you know about the whole situation. No, please, please tell on my kid on air. So, when she turns sixteen, mm-hmm. I wrote her a check. Mm-hmm. She could not cash the check because some involved parties had not done certain things to allow her to cash a check and have a bank account. I won't name any names, but it's the res- people responsible for, <laughs> for procreation. So she was like, can I get, can I just get cash? And I was like, that was kind of rude. <laughs> so she's like, yeah, I don't have a bank, I can't get a bank account. So like, All right, every time you need money, just show your mom this check. So I can get it. <laughs> so, that stuff got squared away, so I actually went and helped her get her first bank account. But because she's a minor, mm-hmm. it was under my main account, and it just so happened the the ass clown that was working at the bank didn't ask who I was in relation to her until after we were done and leaving, because I'm not a guardian. No. So, yeah, right? So, when she turned 18, I was like, hey, you want me to disconnect from your account so you can be a you know an adult now? And you know, she's like, no. <laughs> I was like, what? <laughs> so she was about to tell me 23? <laughs> right? 25. 25. Yeah. 25. Right, but like still to this day, I can see her accounts. So every time like there's an overdraft, but it's like they she always takes care of it, but it's funny because I was like, What are you doing? Right? You need some help? <laughs> and then she's like, No, we got it. We just uh the, the whole Kevin Hart, I got to move one thing to the other thing. Yeah, the- you are the reason why the second generation of you know of us, they, all my kids are responsible. Julian as well. So th- this is what real friends are like. For those that don't know, they take your your uh, children to to open their first bank account because her mother and I did not have her to have a social security number for the first eighteen years of her life. The birth certificate. Yeah, her birth certificate. She had no real name. <laughs> she had no name for the first eighteen years of her life. This is a true story. Will it's not lying. Was it eighteen or sixteen? I think it should have been sixteen. She ended, up it, she, she ended up fixing it on her own, I believe. But yeah, yeah. We, we f that up for a long time. Was this uh, for your oldest daughter? My oldest daughter. Yeah, it's a longer story than it. we weren't like like trying to be off the grid and be cool. We just they fucked up at the hospital, <laughs> and then we just were irresponsible young parents. And luckily, we have very good uh, friends. Now, y'all, y'all, y'all are sovereign citizens. You know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You're asking a nurse for subject matter jurisdiction. <laughs> <laughs> we don't believe in your paperwork here. <laughs> nah, it was it was way more embarrassing than than even Will is letting on to the whole. Young people shouldn't have children. As a young person that had children, <laughs> that was just the. Oof. But thanks, Will. Yeah, I gotta get to this meeting in about five minutes. All right, brother. Love you. All right, love you. Happy yes. birthday. Yes, Will was there also for the birth of of all the first three kids, and uh, yeah. My daughter had no social and her name because they, for some reason, you know, when you have a baby, they come to you at the hospital. They're like, well, what's your kid's name? And we told them their kid's name because we were all excited about the name. And then we saw the lady write it down and somewhere along the line, they missed it. So when she had to get a birth certificate, her name was just baby miles. For the first 16 years of her life, her name was baby miles. 
and she didn't have a social and we were still able to get her into school and everything we would yeah that's what i was wondering we would just find a way to do it because i remember once like my, <laughs> I remember my ex-wife yelling at me like you gotta go get her a social and i was like Arr, Arr. and i went and I, I ran into some obstacle and it had to do with her name we had to change her name and so my daughter ended up doing it on her own and mm -hmm. she says she was this close to changing her name because because she got tired of people calling her J Lo. She thought that was stupid. What is she's well, really stupid? Well, look at it this way: if she gets a pop music career, Baby Miles is a perfect. <laughs> I mean, yeah. You can just go back to it. I love that you're on here just saying which of your kids were like practice kids, like <laughs> which ones you did a good job on, and also just everybody needs to know. They will let your kid into school with like nothing. Like when I was fleeing a situation, I just forged a letter to my mom <laughs> saying that it was cool to live at my aunt's house. And they were just like, all right, you're enrolled. And that's the end of the story. And the state of Florida never looked for me. I still don't think they're looking. I don't even think I got like the carton treatment or any of that. So, <laughs> well, so that's you Florida. That's a barely the United States. <laughs> That fool said he fled a situation. Can we send a shout out to Tammy? It's like 5 a.m. in Australia. And she's just sitting here like, I can't believe these Negroes is still going on about Yo, some shit. Tammy, you know who I am. I do not know who you are, but yeah, like you Tammy, Tammy is a DJ in Australia. Nice. I mean, she does more than that. You, Tammy. Nice to meet you all. It's been she fun. Does. She's a scholar of dance music. She's a scholar of dance music. I was just bored. I mean, she's a DJ as well. Who was a DJ, but she's a PhD that helped her write a book on dance music. She's a professor, an academic. academic. Bert, Bert is sitting there trying to do it in his mind. He's like, you can get a PhD in this shit? <laughs> <laughs> There's nothing you could tell me. Somebody got a PhD in and I'd be like, how'd they get that one over? Like, no. But, uh, how many yeah, how many young Negroes do you know that have like a PhD in hip hop? An official one, or where they're just like, yeah, they call me professor. <laughs> um, <laughs> oh, they have programs called hip hop studies. Can you get a PhD in it? Probably. You can get a grad, undergrad, and graduate degree. I don't know if PhDs, but they have hip hop studies department. I feel like there's somebody that's got to have a hip hop PhD. Oh, I'm yeah. sure. If you like, if you picked ethnography as your main focus and then made it about something the hip-hop scene effectively you could be like i got a phd rap I, I'm not, I wouldn't be shocked there are hip-hop scholars they call themselves hip-hop scholars yes that's a phenomenon do you do you make them break dance for you <laughs> no, I would. They, yo, you don't understand how this whole belief that hip-hop is exceptional is is translated into academia this is serious man Oh yeah, I see yeah, it. I would imagine, I like, imagine though, um, like they throw a cardboard down and then give them a like a spray paint can and then a microphone and like, hey, impress us. So, man, you know, hip hop has been the intellectual gravy train of so much mm -hmm. of the chattering class of Generation X. It's not even funny, bro. Mm. Bill, what what do you say to that, Bill? I think it should be the <laughs> intellectual forefront. I mean, I I. I've told you before, my, my problem with hip hop is I loved it so much, but uh, after uh, NWA, um, Tribe Called Quest, and, and uh, Public Enemy, I don't think anything's grown since then. Mm. So, um, And Bill listens to the most ratchet hip hop in the world, by the way. Oh, does he get your same text? Jason's always trying to be like <laughs> the conscious rap big brother who's like one day away from buying a koofy and telling me like how I need to give Quali a bigger chance. Like <laughs> he's always right there. Oh, that's right. Bertrand, you too young to remember good hip hop. That's the problem. <laughs> <laughs> they all come at me. I just get these texts. There's not one rap song that's come out in like the last 15 years that Jason won't tell me. They just spit it off this and he'll send me some shit where like one note's the same. <laughs> he doesn't care. He wakes up some days and he just wants to like wake up, shit on my stuff. Wake up, yellow nigga. It's time to make a new day. But yeah, Pascal, I, I missed, 
you know, I wasn't born until 88. So I think I miss what most people can or what many people consider the good hip hop. Eh. There's good hip hop now. It's just different, you know. Bill, you be listening to all that gangster shit. Bill be like, "Well, the problem with Young Thug is, <laughs> well, Young Thug's not even that gangster. You see that? Yeah, well, still I, his I, album I, I, I went on a bender for drill rap for a while, but it was mostly still following the stories. And um, you know, uh, Toussaint and I are big fans of Trap Lore Ross and his. Uh, uh, documentaries about uh drill rap and gangs and stuff and um this is disturbing the hell out of me <laughs> yes. hell you think i'm lying bill bill be going to the fucking ghetto ass shows drill we did a whole rap? show about uh, who was the rapper that was on trial for his lyrics young thug oh it's young thug uh, right? yeah Carter? yeah he's he's still on trial it's uh yeah and it's he knew all the drama he knew the backstage drama well it all happened because young thug's baby's mama is a thought well, Granny <laughs> Willis is a national icon now because she's going after Trump, but she went, you know, she went after Young Thug first. Yeah, I, I didn't learn that until like two days ago that the uh, prosecutor in Georgia that's going after Trump is infamous for dropping a hammer on rappers. Yeah, down there. it's yeah, no, she's been that's using Rico, it's like state Rico, to go after them, and that's. That was that whole movement where you had all these, you know, execs from Atlantic Records saying uh, you can't use rap lyrics and everything, and which I thought was pretty disingenuous because uh, all their all their top artists are getting shot and killed or going to jail. So um, anyway, but that's a that's a we we did that show already. <laughs> I clipped it too. Uh, it it is disturbing though. It's yeah. We can have that discussion. And, and Bill, by the way, Bill knows no, music. I, did Jordan did you just change your hair and become a new person? I just took it down. Yeah. I'm You're not a new person. person. No, still me. But guess what I brought? Okay. Uh, Chocolate that okay? cake that only you can eat? That's right. <laughs> <laughs> I can't virtually eat the cake. I can eat it in real life in like three days. There's like no difference between the digital cake that Quinn put on for you and this one, frankly. Sadly. You want me to uh, like vacuum seal, send you something? What do you want from LA? <laughs> <laughs> you want a donut? There's actually like gourmet donuts here, very, very inexpensive. If you have a sweet tooth, um, this is a great place to be, is, uh, is, is Northern Baja. It was my dad's birthday yesterday. He's a New Yorker, and a buddy of his actually sent a package from Katz's Deli. <laughs> Just like full. Oh, of Katz's Deli is, is legendary in New York. Yeah, 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 yeah. So I had like a serious corned beef sandwich on their <laughs> rye with their <laughs> mustard. Yeah. Nice. That's, that's a real friend right there. Yeah. He sent me a cheesecake <laughs> once too. I'm like, how does this even? So, Jason, happen? I'm going to get off here and let other people on. But thank you so much for having me be a part of your birthday. Oh, and Bill, that. thank you so much for being a part of my uh, life. I, I appreciate everything that you've uh, you've added, and our I love our conversations. Um, Bill will hit me up out of the middle of the night and just go off. It'll be like a rant, and uh, I love it. Well. I love it. We both we're both concerned about housing in uh, yeah. California and things like that. So, yeah. anyway, um, you have a great birthday. I, everybody else, it's a great meeting all of you that I have. Uh, Later on, Bill, we'd love to have you Thank on. You, you know, Bill was an assistant on one of my favorite movies, Red Dawn. Do you know well, Bill was assistant on Red Dawn. Red Dawn, wow. Well. Yeah, Bill has a great story about uh, dropping off a script to one of the actors in Red Dawn. I didn't know I'd meet him so soon after you sent him like my boxing text. <laughs> right? Yeah. Bert sent me a. He, he asked me a question about boxing trainers. I was like, "Oh, you got to ask Bill." Bert goes, "Who the fuck is Bill?" I was like, "Everybody knows Bill." <laughs> you don't know Bill? What what the fuck with you? See, Tammy knows Bill now, so Tammy got a fight question. She can just. <laughs> Bertrand, what weight class do you fight at? <laughs> I'm not, this was just like me watching, but um, whenever I, like, I was in any combat, I was always between like 145 and 155, depending on what they had. She said triple featherweight. Did you hear that, Tucson? Called you triple 
Susan gets to make all these physical jokes because no one can see her. Uh -huh. <laughs> That's right. She also understands she's gendered to not see these hands. <laughs> I can't see her hair. I don't know her shade. I don't know what anything looks like. I got nothing over here. It's yeah. really important on this show, obviously. So it really throws a wrench in the whole machinery. Morning fires shot. It Boop. <laughs> it's funny. It's funny because you can just make up whatever you want to make up about Tucson. I feel like in New York, shots, she would get recognized. Jordan, Jordan, keep firing the shots. No, I don't know. <laughs> what is this? <laughs> that's that's <laughs> passed out. Passed out firing sassy shots. I see. <laughs> 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 no, I didn't realize the birthday stream would be such a celebration of um, miscegeny and interfaith, you know, dialogue. It's really, it's a beautiful thing. <laughs> First of all, if you didn't think my birthday was going to be a celebration of misogyny, I, don't know. I said miscegeny, sir. Um, I said misogyny. <laughs> Race mixing. I'm right. talking about being a shitty man. <laughs> Your words, not mine. I think hey. you're very mid, bro. Like, <laughs> yeah. I think you're very mid. That's very Generation Z to say. I think you're very mid. <laughs> mid? I'm a mid misogynist. Like, I'm not all the very. way there. <laughs> I can't. I can't get full misogyny a chance. Please tell us, Jordan. You, you, you want. You want to hear how bad of a misogynist I am? Don't, so no, Tammy, really don't. Tammy, Tammy has videos online, right? Getting ready for the show. She had sent me an email. I swear to God, you sent me an email. You said you can watch these videos. This I talk about the book in these videos instead of you know reading mm -hmm. the whole book. And I couldn't find the fucking email. You didn't say that. Maybe another Tammy did. I don't know, Tammy. I'll get a few emails. <laughs> Just fucking play along, goddammit. You've been here. All the women long. are interchangeable. Yes. <laughs> yes, all of you are the, it's the same white woman. It's just a white woman with accent. Uh, so, so Tammy has this video, and I'm I'm getting ready. I, I did I didn't read the whole book. I'm not gonna fucking lie, but uh, I I okay. did read the, the book and or some of the book, and so I'm watching the videos because I get real nervous before every show, and so I'm getting ready. And put my clothes on, and all of a sudden, I hear Tammy talk about misogyny because someone had asked a question. It was one oh. of the Q and A's you did in Oslo, mm -hmm. and someone had asked a question about misogyny, and kind of—I don't know if they were at. It, it was so confusing. You made the dude ask a few times. Okay. And um, gosh, I don't you, know what this was. You had said something along the lines of, "I know you probably don't think you're being offensive." <laughs> <laughs> but don't get defensive when someone's saying you're being offensive. Oh my God, what was this? I have no idea. And I was like, hmm. damn, she's talking about me. <laughs> <laughs> oh, self absorbed, Jason. That's all I could think. I was like, I didn't even know her when she said this and she was talking. <laughs> <laughs> Jason, you are such a Leo. I'm obsessed. <laughs> Jason, have you seen that, like, Can you please battery? elaborate on that? I'm so not updated on you know astrological characteristics. Leo's, Leos are okay, supposed okay, so to be I very say this. People. Also, mm -hmm. very self obsessed. Um, <laughs> Jason and He's I are. Stupid. Listen, I have a lot of Leo in my chart as well, and I know something that Jason and I have in common is. Every time there's a reflective surface, I know we both look at ourselves. And <laughs> if there's a mirror to check ourselves out in, we're doing it. And he's not looking at the camera right now because I'm right. <laughs> <laughs> and thinking, and listen, I am also delusional. And sometimes I'll hear something. And even if somebody like has no idea I exist, I'm like, that's absolutely about me. Yeah. <laughs> because I'm obviously that important. <laughs> and so him telling Tammy, he's like, that must that must be aimed at me <laughs> it's incredible and i love to see it and i think it is your special day it is your birthday you get to be as jason as you want to be today so yeah hell yeah it was about you that's right she's about to snap too if you think to about that song, i forgot the name of the singer who sang that song i think you i i think you believe this song is about you 
Jason is that guy. <laughs> oh. If you just would have heard the way Tammy said it too, she goes, she goes, she goes. Oh God! I goes, really goes, wish I knew what this if was. If you now. think you're not being offensive, <laughs> so listen to the person because you are. Jeez. And don't get defensive because that doesn't make it better. And I was like, oh, Tammy, wow. why are you fucking talking about me? <laughs> You know, my father was a Leo. My college sweetheart was a Leo. Uh, I have a lot of history with Leos. They're very, they believe that they should be the leader. They're self absorbed. <laughs> mm-hmm. They're very self centered. Uh, uh, yeah, I mean, I get along with Leos, generally speaking. <laughs> they are, they are, uh, generally, ge- you know, Obama was a Leo. <laughs> Bill Clinton and Obama. That's what you guys want to fucking talk to me about today. Jesus. There's a lot of all oh, listen. Leo. Leos are one of the few signs where they're always proud of being that sign. You know what I'm saying? Most people say I'm a Sagittarius. Most people say, okay, I'm a Capricorn. I like, you know, that's what I am. But Leos are like. I'm a Leo and I'm proud. <laughs> Damn it. Man, we have to sing it like a show tune. You know, but, mm-hmm. uh, that's, uh, if you don't know much about astrology, that kind of explains a lot about Leo. I appreciate all of the <laughs> explanations. And the fact. Are you truly like not aware of astro- astrological personality traits? Do you know nothing about this? Or are you just being facetious? I mean, I'll, I'll save my my opinions on it, but I love it when people are really connected to their their sign. I'm just happy. I have a song about being an Aquarius, but that's literally all that I I know about it. Like Never. you wrote it yourself, or no? It's from the musical Hair, actually. Oh, okay, the Age of Aquarius. Oh, oh well, you know, Hair <laughs> is the that's a, that's a great song, Age of Aquarius. I love that song. It is that's yeah. funny. Yeah, that's that's a, no, was, I've just developed a theory that Jason is like the male gaze personified. Actually, <laughs> especially if you've ever heard him talk about uh, women's clothing in terms of uh, "don't touch me." Oh it's yeah, like she's not asking for it is actually his side of the coin. There, oh, you're wearing your "don't touch me" sweat. Oh yeah, so definitely. I'm just wearing the clothing that I have on hand, Jason. But thank you. That's for not it. how that works. Look, you've been <laughs> in a relationship and lived with somebody, and sometimes you have on your "don't touch me." Clothes. If you think that. When I'm about to get dressed, I'm thinking about anybody other than myself. As a Leo, <laughs> you should understand this, I guess. Mm-hmm. Um, you're wrong. Far off. Mm-hmm. Sometimes mm-hmm. Jason, Jason is no. <laughs> this will get me canceled. Jason, Jason. the complication of the male. Also, Jason yes. wearing your shirt with like five of the buttons unbuttoned. That's a Leo personality. <laughs> <laughs> that is. That is. That is. Yeah. Did, Leo. Yeah. Leo men are basically every stereotypical disco dancer from St. Louis. That, okay. <laughs> this is all coming together. Yeah. Y-T-shirt, hair. bad cologne, taco meat hair. You oh, know, my God. <laughs> that, that is a Leo man. <laughs> like, if you, can, Matt, if you want a visualization of a Leo male, like uh, Saturday Night Fever, the guy, yeah. Denny Terrio, he's, that's, that's like a Leo male. Mm-hmm. Pascal is just mad because I'm mad. I'm a very happy Sagittarius. We have great traits. <laughs> it's I, first of all, there's nothing wrong with wanting to only button three buttons with taco meat. It's with a taco little drafty. Meat. It's a little drafty. You know, it's summertime. <laughs> it's a little seventy. <laughs> little 70s. It's summertime. Uh, you know, I'm trying to get to Bert's level of fitness. Is that, oh, I'll never get there. Is that what you're trying to say? Nah, I'm not that fit, bro. Uh, so did you did you Photoshop that picture on your social media profile? No. Damn. Yes. Bert has a picture with his shirt off on his social. This is a guy that writes for the Atlantic. There's a picture of him with his shirt off. He's got a <laughs> 17 pack. I don't know how many abs. He's got a 17 pack. That's a I was odd like, number. How do you have that many abs? <laughs> How? Jason, you're counting his ribs? What's going on here? <laughs> you have to see the picture. He looks like a cartoon. Empty pool. Actually, 
<laughs> Jordan has seen the picture because she gave me the best compliment. She said I looked like a Baki character, and I was like, "That's it, top notch." You can you can just stop now. You've reached Bert. The level. Bert, I don't know what you eat. I've been with you and, and <laughs> been out with you and eaten with you. I'm like, how does he eat the food that he eats? And See, how- this this is some weird mystery for people. I, when you come to visit, that is a celebration. So the point is to not be able to breathe at the end because you always want to take me someplace like Denny's where like $60, we're going to live like king. But uh, like over here, this is just oatmeal, bro. This is what I'm eating when you're not it's around. It's so true. It's funny because it's true. <laughs> like, do you know how much we can buy at Denny's? You know how much food we can get? That's that's the downside of hanging out with me. If you ask me where I want to go eat, it's like, oh, like in the States, somewhere cheap. Where did we go when we hung out? We went to Mel's, Jordan. We still got to go to uh, the chicken joint. We have, to go to, chicken we have to go to Pioneer Chicken in LA. It's the only Pioneer Chicken around. Tammy, do you eat meat? Yeah, it's based, based on what this diet I'm hearing about, it really comes together with Jordan's Jason Miles fart theory. <laughs> Thank you. What is yeah. this? Allegedly, according to Jordan, Jason Miles has, has a fart addiction. Where basically he's always uh, expelling gas from his orifices, whether yeah. his mouth or otherwise. And yeah. <laughs> you're really fleshing this out for me. I like it. Yeah, definitely. Keep going. Yeah, and um, I was like, "Damn, what was this motherfucker eat?" And I said, "And then now that I'm hearing his uh, normal diets, I was like, okay, now I understand why he's always farting." Makes sense. <laughs> Jason eats a lot of fast food, like you know, a lot of inexpensive food. So a lot of inexpensive food, yeah. That's a whole nother show. This the video, show. like Ben always looks like we're hair twins, and I appreciate it. I know Jerry's yeah. <laughs> hair makes him look blacker than me. It's incredible. <laughs> <laughs> ah. Ben, so we have then, to get you a little headband like Bertrand's wearing there. Get him a stocking. I don't get some fix some waves, man. Oh my god! (laughs) If someone has a picture of Ben Burgess with a stocking cap and a Newport, (laughs) oh! If we do that photo shoot, total necessary gold tooth. That's got to be there. I'm thinking of him as like the dude from Hustle and Flow now. (laughs) (laughs) Speaking of Hustle and Flow, Many, many people say this. Tammy, have you seen Hustle and Flow as a as a music scholar? I have not. Why? I couldn't tell you. (laughs) (laughs) That's awesome. Ben, when you see uh, 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 they clone Tyrone, you have the same hair as the white laboratory assistant when they they finally. Jordan, you see. Jordan Jordan just said that to establish that she's seen uh, they clone Tyrone. She's like, look, look, don't don't let me in with the rest of these white people. I have seen the movie. Thank you. Yeah, I I take it back. I just looked it up. I have definitely seen it. I just forgot that it was called that. But yeah, I've definitely seen it. Oh, does it cost something different in Australia? No, no. Uh, I don't think, well, I don't think so. But um, (laughs) it's just really, it's just been a long time. Sometimes licensing issues, they have different titles of movies. I wasn't trying to be like, (laughs) no, 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 that's true. (laughs) What is the thing they call Tyrone? They clone Tyrone. Jordan. What was that? What did I think of it? It was super entertaining, definitely. Really? Yeah. I couldn't get into it. No. Jamie Foxx is in there, right? Yeah. Yes. Is Jamie Foxx Tyrone? No. no, he yeah, plays John the same character. But in Hustle and Flow, there's a character in it um, played by Taryn Manning. And Taryn Manning, you guys might know watching the show from her characters of Pensatucky. I think that was her <laughs> name, right? Yeah. Right? Uh, mm-hmm. in, in the Orange is the New Black show. She's from the South. She's actually from a little bit of money. So that's just acting. But Taryn Manning has Wait, fallen on. Methods. Taryn Manning, she looked, yeah, she definitely has the meth head look. Uh, she now. sadly has the meth head look, and she has fallen <laughs> on some hard times. And she made a live stream video recently that came across my DJ Vlad feed. <laughs> and I swear I sent it to all y'all. I didn't send this to you, Bert, and I didn't. Please, I know I sent it to somebody on this screen. You didn't send it to me. 
I didn't send mm-hmm. it to you. I did. I, I sent it to the group chat. Me, you, Cedric, and Teray. <laughs> Taryn Manning is in this video doing like a live stream on Instagram talking about dating a married married man and licking his quote butthole. Oh, okay. <laughs> He's like, oh, that's not real. <laughs> okay. okay. Did you just say it's like, it's like, quote okay, butthole? Oh, fair enough. <laughs> not paraphrasing. <laughs> Exactly. I, listen, I don't mean to be crass, but I need to. I need to do an intervention here. What is going on with this national trend of people copying to the fact that they like to eat ass? Like, what is this about? Mm. Why are we falling on this time? <gasps> is this a thing in Australia? Um, I no, I don't. Well, I don't know. It could be, but I'm very out of touch. So. <laughs> it, could uh, be. I, it could be, but I think I hear it more in this, a, American. This does not culture. have her finger on the ass in Australia. <laughs> it's got a different name. <laughs> got a, a John Baru. <laughs> it's like oh. my position is like even if you do. Why do you have to let people know? This is, silly. is there any more? Why is the need to announce these things? Right. There's also, I mean, I think this is already kind of dated, but there's like a phrase like eating at like groceries. And it's like, yeah. not all of your groceries are edible. You know, mm-hmm. you gotta buy. That's edible. why I didn't understand. The ones that are edible. The ones that are you eat it all different ways. It's not like right. there's a single way to eat groceries. <laughs> I love this. <laughs> 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 you eat ass. You get it. You get the metaphor. Oh, that's, it. <laughs> that's what. Okay. There we go. Well, like, what we happened in the culture. It was okay. It was like, yo, rock out, eat some ass, man. Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> and does, and Somebody does... clip that. <laughs> <laughs> I do, I refuse to believe Taylor. I did not send you that Taryn Manning clip. Jason, do you think that if you had sent me a video of Pensatucky from Orange Is the New Black talking about eating ass, that I would not have had <laughs> paragraphs of things to say about that? I didn't think it was. I real. would have left work for the day. <laughs> Taylor's like, I've got to rewatch Crossroads now. Like, there's so much analysis. Yeah, I've got. She's oh obviously effed up, and again, I don't know what she's on. It's beyond just being drunk, but she's bragging about a married drunk dude. Drunk on ass, man. That's the effect that it's having. <laughs> <there. laughs> yeah, it's some wild shit, man. Because first of all, I'm ticklish. Oh, God. Like in particular, your ass. Yeah. How, do you, find How do you know you're ticklish and your ass cracked, dude? That's I don't know. Maybe Pascal, someone tried to crack it open like a goddamn coconut when I wasn't ready. <laughs> 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 Happy uh, birthday, Jason. TMI <laughs> to a whole new goddamn level. <laughs> This is really, I really didn't need to know this action <laughs> about motherfuckers cracking your ass over like a coconut. <laughs> Damn. What I love about this, and I don't know if all of you know, like the little, the, the tropes of porn, but one of the big ones for black porn is just like dudes not taking off their boots or their shoes. <laughs> oh, yeah. That's yeah. Uh, like, so now I've just got this image of Jason Wright. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing. And welcome it's, back, and you Warren. Got, you can't Thank just, you. You know, Warren coming back with his, you know, Jedi Knight like monastery personality, listening to all this shit. He's like, "The fuck is wrong with you people?" Correct. <laughs> 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 you're right. No, Warren, the fast guy. You're right. I'm out of here. This is fucking ridiculous. Barn is like, I got to save what little bit of my reputation I have. Left. <laughs> this shit is beneath me. I'm out of here. Tammy was like, I have a real job. <laughs> I got to bounce, but I'm proud of you all for being out here, normalizing assy and just being a part of it. 
Jason, I hope the next time is more gentle. And, uh, yeah, you have a great one, man. Thank you very much, Bert. Bye, Bert. Bye, Bert. Bye, Bert. Bye, Bert. Derek, can yeah. you answer Pascal's ass-eating question? What about it? Why I have no idea has, what the question is. Why has the culture, why has the zeitgeist popularized the phenomenon of dis- discourse discourse on ass eating because people under 35 grew up on porn Damn, that's a pretty direct question that's that's so interesting my my mind went to is it like a woke thing because it's like sex positivity but gone completely toward the sort of vulgar sex positivity direction but i think you might be more right speaking <laughs> of sex positivity like the discourse on ass eating said made it sound like the name like maybe the title of a book from the 1600s <laughs> <laughs> the discourse on ass eating hey on sex the discourse pos- of ass eating as as, a, as something so i can't let me go with hey, it. as hey. understood by a younger millennial <laughs> in the prime of his youth exactly yeah. Yeah. Okay, so so listen, Taylor. I sent Taylor this video. <laughs> There's this white woman. She's obviously drunk, and her husband is embarrassed behind her. She goes up to this black dude, who's doing some sort of like man on the street interview thing, and the white woman goes, "Look, you get me about five of the biggest black cocks you know, and bring them over. Tell them we're gonna have an orgy, because I got this fantasy right of my husband doing something." And the husband is just sitting there and he's like trying to like hide. And I sent that I sent that to Taylor. Deal with YouTube where you can't be demonetized anymore. (laughs) (laughs) Ben, we've been demonetized for your fucking philosophy show. So at this point, I don't know what goes with these people. Yeah, it's such a like mystery. What kind of conversation? Like, what the fuck? I can't remember the exact episode. But we asked for a review, and they were like, after reviewing it, we decided that we can't, we're not going to run ads on this show. And I was like, it's a philosophy show. It's not like they were, who are they bullying? But you could have mentioned like fascism or suicide or something like that. Let's just use all of the words that'll get. Yeah, no. <laughs> COVID. <laughs> Jew. Exactly. Like, totally. <laughs> this is why I'm not monetized because I don't have to worry about why I'm not getting canceled by YouTube. Like, yeah. D- dude, I Derek, I need to send you this video too because this woman is so insane. And, and Taylor <laughs> responds. Like that. That she goes, That's so cute. She oh, goes. She goes. I think that this. What did you say? Yeah, I, I said. I think sex positivity has gone too far. We need more sex <laughs> negativity. <laughs> yes, this one feels way too comfortable. Because you should see the look on the black dude's face as she's asking for these things. She's like, five. Did she say big black dicks? Or she said BBCs? I think she said BBCs. See, uh, that's a direct, that's that's an example of a direct. Jason wants to owe you two money by the end of the stream. Yeah. That's That's a direct example of porn culture transferring into real life because BBC is a porn. Yeah, that's a porn mm-hmm. term. It's not the British Broadcasting Company. Oh, <laughs> so uh, my, my neighbor and I were talking about about my dating problems. Oh, uh, my neighbor. <laughs> so you know Scotty. Uh, so my neighbor, my neighbor and I were talking. It was me, him, and his wife, and I was telling them about you know they were asking me about my dating life, and I was whining about it. And no. my neighbor looks at me, and goes, "Oh, she was looking for the BBD." <laughs> and I said, "I'm sorry." He goes, yeah, all women want the BBD, the bigger, better deal. Oh, my God. Wow. <laughs> wow. Okay. <laughs> you know, there's a weird irony with the sex positivity stuff, though, because I don't think anyone I know under 25 has sex. That's like, what I was thinking at as all. well. There's, the a, there's, a there's a we've window. There's a window. We've got incels. We've got people who think it's gay to have sex with women if they're men. No, there's a Wait, window. What? Oh, yeah. I, I think the sex positivity affected women more than men. And it, 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 it opened up more options for women to engage. Because I've never heard young men talk about being sex positive. Actually, I think the, the incel thing is what dominates younger men more than anything else. They're I watched interested. a video about a dude saying he loved to get pegged, so I think there's some dudes that are positive about that. So. 
that okay. <laughs> All right, coconut. Like, coconut. Like, on that one for a second. <laughs> now the room's uncomfortable. <laughs> I'm fine. Um, <laughs> I don't get uncomfortable. Uh, it's, it's funny, like, like I've been to like uh, uh, kink dungeon things that are secret around here. You get invited to them, but what's hilarious about them is if you think the eyes wide shut, they're not that. They're uh, they're theater nerds, basically. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Wait, are you and telling that, me that the people who go to the kink shows are actually just theater nerds? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yes, I am, and I'm telling you the people participating in them are like lonely exhibitionist theater nerds. Who do you think wants to do weird shit like that? Fucking Joe the Postman or Tommy the Thespian? I mean, this is the thing, though, right? <laughs> I had a crew of cats I knew in my college in law school years who were certified freaks. And they, <laughs> they, no, they, no, they were into swinging. They were into some real, you know, alternative life sex shit. And there are people like that who are not like theater nerds or whatever. And they, they're just in life. They're in that part of their world. And and I think they've. All, I think people like that have been around since the sexual revolution, like from the sixties and seventies. That that's not new, but something happened in the age of digital technology, i.e., the internet, post internet, particularly in the aughts, where the, I think the internet started socializing younger people into their sexual views and mores <clears throat> because, and I, I think. Uh, Vaughn is right because of access to online porn that was shaping expectations in a way that even my generation. I mean, we had. I mean, we had porn was on cassettes when we were young. You go and you you steal your your mom and dad's. You know, they got oh, dad's got a dirty cassette. Ooh ah, or you know, you can you know you hijack one where you can get one, but it wasn't like you could just turn on your computer and you're like streaming like you know. You porn or whatever the hell else. Yeah. At, it, at a it, certain point, the the access to online porn starts to infiltrate the psyche of a certain age group that changes their sexual mores more so than it did for people who are a little bit older. Do you think I'm off with that? No, I think you're. I think you're right. I think, but I think it's what I think is different about it is it desensitizes people to sex in a way that like makes it not particularly interesting to younger people like I, I a lot of these kids i mean i say this as a teacher and i'm an english teacher so kids confess all sorts of stuff to me i can't talk about but uh one of the things i'll tell you is like they don't date they don't but they've been exposed to porn since they were like five and their they parents have less like, interface for dating and interacting as well like we always talk about the loss of the commons and where do people go to hang out so at least when they had access but more limited they also could balance it out by actual personal experience and and you know you know the juxtaposition with reality and figuring out what you actually like or want uh, with another person now you can't really do that as much you have a menu of everything that you could want. Your desires are escalated as you get desensitized. And uh, real people feel like they have to do this performative thing based on what they've seen. And maybe that's not so fun. And it, it's actually discouraging for sexual encounters eventually. So, that's yeah. frightening because I've seen some horrible things on the internet. <laughs> yes, so scary shit, man. Yeah, I know. You usually send it to us. <laughs> you no, know, every time. Please, Jesus. Tammy, are you happy that you're not on this fucking uh, thread of messages from me? Uh, no, I feel extremely left out. <laughs> because I got all the first things. You said nothing but a word. <laughs> ben doesn't want to be on the list. He's like, please don't add me to this. I won't always reply, but I'll enjoy receiving them. You don't have to. Re- that's the whole joy of this relationship is that you don't have to reply because you're a leader wow. <laughs> <laughs> i thought if i stopped replying it would like discourage the same you know, thing, but no, but now I know the more than the race science <laughs> <laughs> oh wow 
I, who would have known that my birthday show would devolve into a conversation <laughs> about the youth being desensitized to porn? And actually, it's more right on brand if you tell me. Yeah, that's good, right? <laughs> about every third time I come on, somehow this comes up as a topic because I'm Mr. Wet Blanket. You guys are always having fun about something. I'm just like, well, you know, the sociological fact about that is that everything sucks. Yeah, so, I thought I'd be here talking with Pascal about the 50 year counter revolution, and here we are. <laughs> well, Tammy, sometimes the, the overindulgence of ass eating is part of the 50 year <laughs> counter revolution. Ass eating in the counter revolution probably does need to be a book. And yeah, yeah, I, for sure. <laughs> this is going to be super rich content for you know historiography a few decades in the future. Ass so. eating in the counter revolution. <laughs> this isn't even the champagne room. <laughs> By the way, I haven't even said this once on the show. This is the Saturday free show. So usually on Saturdays we go a little over the the hour. We want to give you guys a glimpse of what happens in the patron only champagne room. And I would say, easy. Uh oh. Uh -oh. Froze. Uh -oh. The deep uh -oh. state. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Too much ass eating. YouTube was like, no, no, we're not going to let him actually try to no. capitalize yeah. on this. This is no more promotion, nice. homeboy. Well, yeah. Uh, I think all of us probably could have expected that this is exactly where everything was going to go. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, uh, it was chaotic. And. It, I just think that, like, we started off with Paul Robeson and we got here. So, we got here. <laughs> yeah. Paul Robeson singing uh... Christian themed <laughs> Jim Crow music. And now we're talking about ass eating and porn. It's a, it's a day, boy. How was, uh, how was Norm? Did he, uh, did he, he discourse on ass eating? No, no, I don't think. <laughs> I don't think Norm would be ready for discourse on ass eating. You would be surprised. Not. He's the man that introduced the term gooning to a lot of our uh, our audience. <laughs> he did. True. Yeah, that's true. Well, he that did introduce gooning. And he was like going to this like uh, publication. He said that was do in doing gooning or something like that. Yeah. The, the thing is with Norm is <laughs> Norm often encounters the internet like like an anthropologist from another planet. So mm -hmm. he'll like, I heard this term to gay, gooning. I did not know what this was, and now I do. And the rest of us are just like, no one should let the internet and Norm Finkelstein interact very much. Like, it just... Amazing. Amazing. Yeah, Ben, he, he came here. It was first off with Varn, who was just in stunned silence for, like, the first 15 minutes. Yeah, first thing <laughs> first um, first and, thing he tell Tammy how racist Australia is. I that's right. Like, there was that. Uh, he was asked, why are you here? Because Jason wasn't aware of the surprise birthday stream yet. And he said he didn't know. Uh, and that you <laughs> had invited him. So you just, you just did what you were told. So, <laughs> fantastic. Good, man. This is a good answer. <laughs> Wow, wow, so Chuck, can we get Jason back or you think it's time to wrap up? I think Jason is trying to get back right now. Pascal, I'd love to um I'd love to see you at some of these popular music conferences where there's a whole section for hip hop scholars. Wow. Um I feel like you would have a heart attack or something in that space. No, I, I, you don't want me to do violence in public. <laughs> I don't think I would want to attend it because I think these people are charlatans. You know, yeah, you would hate it. The idea that hip hop deserves its own genre in academia is comical to me. But hey, you know, it's people... not the dumbest thing in academia these days. You can say that. Like Ivy League classes on comic book studies being probably my least favorite. Oh, that they got that too. That's a thing. Comic books. Yes, that's out. definitely a thing. <laughs> They're an American art form. Comic, cool. book oh, come on. comic book studies comic books and jazz but this I mean, is all in the kind of the tradition of subcultural like this all comes from the, the same kind of cultural studies subcultural studies tr tradition that's like 40 years old 50 years old now i think it's just that in american institutions it never quite took off the same way or it didn't quite become like you had undergraduate classes on this stuff in the uk for a really long time um Hey, but, hey. Yeah. hey, Jason's back. Nope, he's nope. not. No, nope. he's not back. <laughs> but like when I go to conferences with Americans, they're always 
confused because what people outside the US do is often um, in music studies is a mix of different disciplines. We, we're in a field of music studies. We're not divided by discipline, but in the US people are still very, very divided by discipline. So they're like, I don't understand what you do when you do a bit of discussion of music and sound and a bit of discussion of culture and you bring them together. What are you? I don't know the label. They're very confused. So, but I think now that is breaking down because capitalism and they need to attract students to university. So they got to do comic book studies. Wow, that's true. It feels like devoid of a comparative element though. It just seems like so hyper-specialized and what are people even learning? Well, the humanities is desperate for students right now. I mean, uh, you know, as a person who used to be a lecturer at a university, it's, it's something that it, the the funding base and the student base for a lot of stuff just isn't there. So like um, there are mid-sized universities who are just getting rid of entire programs, including like all foreign languages and like most of the humanities and um, history. I mean, even history is on the chopping block in some schools. Yeah, it's uh, and and so it's kind of it's in the U.S. in particular because of the particular way of our culture war. But and there's kind of both the the woke unwoke culture wars and there's also the science versus everything else culture war too we don't talk about that one as much um there is this tendency right now i think to just like want to have these really popular crosses and like yeah like you know the tolkien studies comic book studies are popular but they also are delimited uh like delegitimizing to to legislatures who control the purse strings for the humanities and then what tends to happen afterwards is like that's used as an excuse to further defund the the humanities push that further out and then um turn it all into practical stuff but then the practical stuff actually goes out of date really fast and students aren't as interested in it and and it's it's a cycle and and so that's what we're doing right now um i i think it's interesting the interdisciplinary thing because for some reason in the United States, most of this ends up in my department, the English department, and I often don't understand why. Mm-hmm. Like, I'm like, I don't know why we're talking about comic books and film. Like, I, I you know, I'm being, I'm being snarky. I don't love co- like critical comic book th- studies, but, but, uh, um, anyway, but, um, but I do think it's actually it would be worth studying in an intercultural context. There's a lot of like anthropological stuff you could really learn from this, right? And, um. I think what ends up happening is it gets stuck in English and for whatever reason, and it kind of tends to stagnate there because it, it is, you don't have the same interdisciplinarity. You, you tend to go into literary criticism and get stuck there. And that's all I'm going to say. I was just thinking that there may be um, sort of an underrated argument uh, for, uh, for free college is that uh you know, students would be less pandered to since they, uh, since <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> they're not consumers anymore, right? Like, you know, maybe like, sure, the overall numbers might be relevant for funding, but like, you know, yeah, there, there's there's definitely an, a, uh, there's definitely an unused uh, grumpy old man argument for free college that's on the table there. Nice. It's really good. Well, Maybe on that note, we uh, we wrap up Jason's birthday right. stream since he's <laughs> missing in action. And thank everyone for, for coming. Oh, okay. I was able to come back. All right, I was able to come back in. Uh, that was just a power surge. My power was out literally for two seconds, and then it just took forever to get back in. So. Is that the, the storm, or is that just Rosarito being Rosarito? I'm sure it's a little bit of both. <laughs> They're prepping for the storm. So I have to go open my gate if I want to leave my house today. Oh, Jesus, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, can I just say a very special happy birthday from the following? Mm-hmm. Uh, they were not able to make it today for whatever reason. Mac says happy birthday. Oh, fuck yeah. Uh, Cedric, the professor, says happy Thank birthday. You. Steve and- Paxton also. <gasps> Yeah, he was in chat before he couldn't get into the screen. He was having connection issues. And to Ray. Yes. It was very hard to get in. It was a very packed party we had. That, you know, Chris was supposed to be here too, by the way. Matt Christmas was supposed to be here? Yeah. Chris Riggins. Oh, Chris Riggins, you said. That's oh, my oh fuck. Chris yeah. Riggins was supposed to come down here and he had to cancel his trip. I told him the storm is too much. 
I'm really sad about that because I was so looking forward to having so much inappropriate fun with Chris Riggins. Well, he's performing oh. in San Diego tonight, so if you want to come up. I am not trying to leave. You act like there's retaining walls on those mountains where the rocks are. Do you think that performance is actually going to happen? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Tonight? Yeah. When's the storm starting? Tomorrow? Tomorrow. Tomorrow. Still, I'm I'm terrified of how bad is it predicted to be? Like it's a tropical storm, right? <laughs> you know, it, you and Ben are from places where there's real weather. Yeah. Have, yeah. Everybody on the screen except for me and Jordan. And Jordan lived in Israel. I don't know what the weather's like over there, but you know, oh, when you yeah. live in California, Sandstorm. when it rains for longer than a day, the news comes on and goes storm watch. Yeah. And I'm not talking like serious rain, like just regular ass rain. So we're not used to, and Southern California is even worse than the Bay Area when it comes to like dealing with weather. So I can't drive in the rain. I don't really like snow. So anytime the weatherman comes on and goes, it's going to be cold outside or uh, there's going to have rain, then I act as if it's some sort of end of the world catastrophic disaster. And I panic. Be careful because you don't have the infrastructure for it. I mean, when people talk about like driving in the snow, like you need to be trained on it and That's have right. the roads yeah. cleared and whatever. Like I can do it now, but when I was in Georgia, I couldn't. Yeah, Derek, and, you should have seen me touring all those years. <laughs> <laughs> it's hard not it, touring around the United States and not being able to drive in the rain, though. That's that's uh, hard. Yeah, Derek, <laughs> it was that I was in the van <laughs> with. With a woman that was from Canada, and I remember the first time I saw snow come at me, we were driving up a pass to Oregon, and I was like, and I woke her up. She was asleep. I woke her up. I was like, there's something falling from the sky. What is this? And she was like, because <gasps> she woke up, so she was terrified, and she was like, it's just snow, stupid. And I was like, I can't drive in this, and I pulled over, and then she had to drive the rest of the way up. Uh it, we get fun stuff here like snow and sandstorms at the same time so. you know, yeah i've been all over the horrible weather of the u.s and i don't like it i don't like it i'm not a fan of it i really like sitting put here and doing this podcast just like pascal loves florida easy easy <laughs> he loves the alligators when was the last time you shoveled anything Oh, I grew up showing in snow, bro. Uh, exactly, and you re are going to retire, not. I, I mean, no, I hate snow. I despise snow. Yeah, it's I think I, it's 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 an abomination. Yeah, it's stupid. Abomination. Yeah, we have like four seasons here: spring, fire, <laughs> fall, ice. That's pretty much what we got. So, <laughs> the last time I was in Utah. It was the spring, and it was gorgeous snowing. In spring. It was snowing as fuck. Oh well, yeah, it snows in March. I mean, I don't think I, I don't consider spring. Spring is like from from late May till June. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, it was it was March. It was late March. I will never forget. It was late March, and I was like, "This ain't right." So I remember saying, "Is this ain't right?" Um, Tammy, does it snow where you live in Australia? It doesn't snow where I live. Um, but it does snow. There are mountains not too far. Um, yeah, and they have a proper snow season. So do you know the same pain that Jordan and I have when it comes to, like, weather? What do you mean? If the sun's not shining, then it's a bad day. Uh, uh, in a lot of Australia, people feel that way. Certainly when I lived in Sydney, that was the vibe. Uh, but um, the weather's all over the place now. Um, and, yeah, Sydney was raining for, like, a year without stopping almost uh, and <clears throat> it was sort of subtropical rain but it was still you know rain uh, and Melbourne's cold but a bit more like British weather so more like oh. wet wet and gray oh. in winter yeah and it's winter now so it's wet and gray <laughs> oh yeah but um, Melbourne gets very hot summers so it gets quite extreme heat but it doesn't last it's not like in Texas where it just sits there and lasts for weeks <laughs> and weeks um it just it, you it, wait it'll be like that soon and tell probably yeah, yeah. Pro <laughs> we're, we're probably gonna have our worst fire season yet this summer we're all very scared and that's saying a lot because like four years ago three years ago you had like a very a bad. massive fire koalas were on fire it was bad it was really really bad yeah. yeah that was literally the january before covid hit yeah so, maybe well, it was like oh, three yeah. years ago right. yeah wow mm -hmm. crazy fires right now and um Western uh, Canada. 
unbelievable. Yeah, say, and like so far north. I can't yeah. believe how far north they are. It's it like they had worse fires north of us in, in uh, Galbarda than we did here. Like that's so um, wild. Because we usually have like we're usually the outer edge with the California, you know, into the desert burning uh, area. And this year it skipped over us and went north. So it was bad. That's, that's, that's... So crazy. Right, well, I saw I saw like a fire map and it it showed Alaska being affected as well. Isn't that like, wild? That's basically the Arctic. Like what yeah, the heck? Yeah. yeah frozen it's... fire. The tundra well, and the tundra. Speaking Horrible. of frozen fire, it's time for us to say bit adieu. Tammy, I I owe you so much because you hung out for four hours. It was so much fun. <laughs> what a chat. You, you are officially the longest yeah. guest ever. So <laughs> I don't know. That's right. The only thing I can think to do if you're if you're down. If you if you're down to, to to be bold enough to wear this on your campus, I will get you a TIR or something. I have I have I have merch. You have merch? Oh, yeah. oh, oh merch my god! Um, you you <laughs> sent it to me. We were talking. You sent it to me in um, Minneapolis. I visited Minneapolis. That was me. Damn. Oh shit! Okay. Yeah, and um. Yeah, so I, I have a T-shirt and and a hoodie, and I wore both of them at this academic conference in Minneapolis. <laughs> wow, that, that is awesome! Really I have people real. ask questions. It starts conversations, that's for sure. You need to get an Anglo pessimism shirt. So bad. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so tempted, but I, I I don't think I don't know. Universities are not a friendly place. To... <laughs> <laughs> there. Well, look, yeah. thank you guys all. Ben, Jordan, I'll see you guys in real life soon enough. Very soon. Um, let's Happy let's birthday, get out Jason. of here. Thank you. Happy birthday, Jason. Happy birthday, Jason. Happy birthday, Happy birthday, Jason. Jason. This My is partner, the... Jason Miles. Pascal, thank you for making this one of the funniest birthdays. <laughs> <laughs> and Toussaint and Jordan, if you guys were part of putting this together, thank you guys so much. This and was, Pascal, uh, I'm a huge fan. I'd love to talk to you again. More about oh, it. look at that. Look at that. Oh, I really Pascal appreciate fandom that. is real. Tell Jason to send you my email that we can talk or anytime. Like I'm, like I'm preventing it from happening. <laughs> <laughs> the chat right there. Absolutely. All right. You're very welcome, Jason. Hey, thank you guys. And uh, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Let's get ready. Let's get ready. On, on that note, we are 46. Out. We are 46. 